Um, Bill and I are now at the phase where we Yeah, clear. Okay. So we're live, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's a little bit after six o'clock. This is the um, workshop of the uh, Scarborough Town Council. I'm Sean Baybar, I'm the chairman. Uh, for the record, for the um, workshop, is that we do have all of our councils here, except for Councilor Chiazzo, who is out of town on business. Um, so he sends his best, and we'll be back soon. Um, what I, tonight's uh, topic um, is the uh, discontinuance of uh, Avenue 2 and the work that has been completed by our staff as well as um, some citizen input and uh, regular meetings and work groups that they've held. Um, and I just want you to know that while this is a council workshop, there will be an opportunity for public comment at the end uh, so that we can hear from anyone that would like to speak on that, including the other participants. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom for introductions and to uh, get us on our way. Terrific. Um, I've been pleased to work on, I guess, behalf of the town and, and residents um, regarding the matter of the potential discontinuance of Avenue 2. There have been a series of meetings that I've been pleased to be part of and posted them here at Town Hall. There's also been, I believe, at least one, if not two, field meetings, kind of site walks uh, for folks on a couple of different occasions to really get a sense of, <coughs> from a on-the-ground perspective what we're looking at. And I think it was so far as in so detail as to tag picture trees and talk about species. So uh, a lot of work has been done. And I'm pleased to bring this back to you um, on behalf of kind of this working group. Uh, we think it's ready for uh, council's attention or at least consideration again. Uh, there's a, so from my perspective, and others may um, disagree with me, it, it appears as though um, generally we've worked through all the open issues. Um, and again, I'm certainly pleased to have people stand up and, and speak otherwise if that's the case. Uh, there are a couple of uh, outstanding issues that really are for the council to, to discuss and perhaps there'll be time at the end of this meeting or some point during it to, uh, to bring those up. And I'm pleased to, to bring them up at that time if you like. Um, ben McCall has been representing us. He's, uh, he's been working alongside Derwood Parkinson but has really been involved uh, over the summer uh, most directly in um, he did prepare a memorandum for your benefit, just to kind of walk through the, the documents such as they are. Uh, but the good news is we're staying within the kind of the same legal construct that we talked about, an order discontinuance with uh, multiple easements coming back to the town that have a number of very clearly negotiated uh, and detailed um, restrictions associated with them. 
that uh, direct what can and can't happen within that area. Um, I did invite Keith Smith here at the table. Keith is a um, landscape architect uh, hired by Mr. Gendron. Um, he's the, been the one that's produced the landscape plans, and to the extent that you want to talk about those details, I thought it'd be helpful to have him handy. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like Ben just to kind of walk you through and introduce, and then we can uh, take it whichever direction you like. Yep. So good evening, everybody. Um, again, Ben McCall from Berkman Parkinson. Uh, we've been working with uh, Tom and uh, John Bannon, uh, Mr. Gendron's attorney, as well as Ben Leone, um, attorney for uh, the Pine Point Neighbor Neighborhood Association. Um, last time this was before you was back in May, um, and it was at that point where uh, a number of Pine Point neighbors um, came to that meeting and, and asked uh, <coughs> for some additional consideration to go in, into this process. And I'm happy to report that since that point, it, it, as Tom mentioned, it's been a very collaborative process. Um, we've met here at Town Hall a number of times, and there have been a number of site walks. And I really just wanted to go over a couple of key points that were laid out in, in my memo that was in your packet. Um, and really just to discuss the key changes that are in the documents um, that were also included in the packet, and then discuss um, the potential legal avenue forward if, if that's what you uh, as a body decide to do. Um, so the bottom line is, is that the, the legal outcome of the situation hasn't changed since May, or at least the proposal hasn't. The proposal would be for the town to discontinue this portion of Avenue 2, which is everything south of King Street. Um, and in return for that, the town would be receiving two sets of easements, if you will. Um, one from Mr. Gendron, um, who owns that property, um, and then one from collectively from the Gables uh, by the Sea Condominium Association. Uh, what those easements would do would be to set um, very stringent restrictions on the use of the discontinued property, but also would perpetually protect uh, public access to Pine Point Beach, which were the two main goals that the town had, and certainly uh, that the neighbors had also um, throughout this process. So, um, without getting too much into the weeds in this, I want to explain sort of how these documents have, have changed. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that um, the titles have changed and how they're laid out has, has sort of changed. Uh, the reason for that really is just for clarity's sake. Uh, it's not uh, really changing the, um, the legal reality on the ground, if you will. What has been created is what's termed a public path easement um, that will run uh, for uh, the entire distance um, of, of Avenue 2 and will be 10 feet wide, so five feet from the center line in each direction. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in effect, Mr. Gender will be conveying a five foot wide public path easement and the gables also. And then the other portions are, are what's termed a public conservation easement. Um, these are areas that are meant to be undisturbed, um, with the exception of this rather intricate uh, landscaping plan that Mr. Gendron and, and um, Terry Duan and Associates have prepared. And then on the gable side, um, one key change that has occurred since last time is uh, they will have the ability to demarcate uh, basically the boundary of the public path um, with the split rail style fence. So, It'll be the same style fence that is in place already. It will just simply be relocated to, to better guide the public as to what the public path is and what isn't. Um, finally, there, there were some additional provisions that um, were discussed extensively with the Pine Point Neighborhood Association and have been added to the documents. Um, the first is that the town will be supplying signage um, right at King Street at the beginning of the path, similar to what's there already. Um, but we'll make very clear that Avenue 2 continues to be a public way to the beach, but also that um, the use of uh, motorized vehicles is prohibited. The only exceptions that are laid out um, contemplate things like um, a, an ATV used by EMS, um, Scarborough Fire Department, in order to, to get people who are ill or injured off the beach. Um, and explicitly what we've we've laid out towards the end of these easement documents is a clear statement of intent um, that these documents do not in any way um, settle or deal with um, issues of public or private ownership of the beach. 
Um, that was never the intent of the documents, but we want to make very clear that um, these documents don't affect ownership rights in any way, shape, or form. Um, and neither do they affect uh, rights of speech access outside of, of what's clearly laid out um, in terms of the public path. And so the, the rest of the workshop is intended at least to answer all of your questions, um, whether they be legal, whether they have to do um, with the landscape plan. Um, I know that Mr. Gendron is, is here also, um, but I wanted to lay out before I sort of finish what the council has the option of doing um, at this point. And so the way the process would <coughs> work if the council is so inclined um, is, is to order the discontinuance of this portion of Avenue 2. Now, this is laid out in the main law. This is a three-step process. So um, you would only be initiating action tonight. Um, there's, a, there's a legal document. Um, that is the order of discontinuance. That would be signed, again, if the council so chooses and filed with the clerk, um, the town clerk. There would then be a public hearing um, allowing members of the public to, uh, to give their input as to that plan. Um, and then at some date in the future, uh, no fewer than 10, 10 days after that public hearing, you could vote, um, the council could vote uh, to effectively ratify that discontinuance. Um, the only catch in that, um, I know, and I don't see anybody from the Gables um, here, uh, they hold their annual meeting um, of their condominium association in late November. And so um, while their president and their board are supportive of the documents that have been um, crafted, um, we, the town would likely not be able to get a final easement deed um, blessed and then signed by the Gables until that annual meeting. And so th the plan would be effectively is that when we, when and if um, the town moves in that direction and uh, those final easement deeds are ready, that would be the time when the final vote would happen. So effectively the discontinuance would be ratified and the town on the same day would receive these easement deeds, which again restrict, act, uh, restrict use of Avenue 2, but also protect public access. Um, I think uh, I will I will leave it there, but um, uh, of course I'm happy to answer any of your questions. And the timing of this, uh, I guess the good news is parties have been working diligently and in, in are at a point in time to, to share the results with you. Also, it, it does occur to me that this council is aware of the background issues and it would be great to uh, perhaps continue to move this along under your um, constitution as a, as, a, uh, as a body that's not required, certainly, um, but it happens to line up nicely in that regard. So um, I actually have a couple of legal questions. So um, would the council like to talk first about schematic and some of the pieces surrounding that first? Would you like to get into the timeline and the legal pieces? Uh, what's the preference? I just didn't want us to jump back and forth in between comments. I think if you have the questions, they may be someone else's questions, so I think you should take the floor. My, my concern would be that we would run out of time and not get a chance to talk about uh, with tenancy. Our discussion of tenancy run like long. That's good advice. So I have, very, I have two very short questions. Yeah, I would, I would ask them. And they're purely process and timeline. So regarding the Gables vote, is that a majority vote or is it 100%? So. It, Originally, we had proposed to the Gables that we that the town would prefer um, that we receive 100% ratification from from their membership. Um, Nick Scasha, who is the president of their board and is also an attorney, um, we last met on Monday. Um, he is going to look into his own association bylaws okay. and to make sh and to figure out um, what they need in order to ratify. Okay. Um, the town, it, I, I suppose there are two questions. One is whether the, the Gables can, with just a majority vote, ex, um, deliver the easement to the town. That's probably the case. We would still, the town would, uh, prefer. would prefer and hold out for 100% um, support from them. And there's only seven members. I'm, right. I'm not saying that's necessarily going to be easy, but it's not an infinite number. There's so something to consider and not necessarily discuss tonight is what is the council's uh, present uh, 
preference. If our preference is um, to have 100% and we only get six out of seven, um, how do we deal with that? So I'm not, I don't want to talk about it. I just want us to kind of understand the difference between what we want that's the nicest thing and what is legally required. The last is the timeline. So with them, is it um, feasible to believe that we can pass um, the, um, the three actions that are part of this prior to the meeting pending the outcome of that? Or should we wait until after because it will be the timeline that kind of dictates, you know, tonight, the public hearing, and then that piece? Well, so two out of those three steps can certainly occur beginning tonight. Okay. If the council so chooses, you can order the discontinuance and then hold a public hearing on your meeting, during your meeting on the 18th. Okay. Um, however, uh, it would be our suggestion at least that the town, the, the road is not officially discontinued until that final vote of the council. Right. And um, it would certainly be our suggestion that that vote not take place until after their until we have both easement deeds in hand or set to be delivered that night because we would want that, those yes. two actions to happen. Okay. That's all I have for the process and legal. Any questions regarding... Uh, I just want to quick point of clarity um, before any discussion. Yeah. You, when you were introducing this, you, uh, your words were um, you know, that the property owned by Mr. Gender and the property owned by the Gables. It's my understanding that we wouldn't be here if we actually knew who owns the property. <laughs> so I just wanted, for the, for the audience and people at home, I'm just making clear that that's actually uh, in contention as to who owns, owns it. Some believe the town owns it, some believe each of the abutters own it. Is that correct? That, yeah, perhaps I was a little less precise with my words than I should have been. Um, what I meant to indicate is that if the town were to discontinue the road, then it would the title would pass to, to the center line to both, and then I was just explaining what would happen with each of those pieces, yes. but you are you are correct. I just want to be clear, because sometimes people watching at home don't always follow the same way. Thank you. Peter? Just a quick question on, on sort of your introductory letter, and it's really the last bullet, beach ownership and access. What does that exactly say? Does this, does this really say that we don't know, even with the past, with the path, whether there's going to be beach access guaranteed to the public? No, quite the opposite, actually. The okay, what is it? The specific, because it says it does not determine the existence of beach access rights or ownership. Um, so, just some clarity on that. So, yep. Well, so, so th this is, and um, the same language appears in both the proposed table deed and the proposed gender deed, and it's um, it'll be the last section. But I'm looking at the gender deed, which is included in your packets. It's um, Roman numeral six and then sub A and it just says this instrument along with everything else that's included will not affect in any way and first the existence, lack of existence or availability of any legal or equitable remedy to protect private rights associated with Avenue 2 including the right to access, use or otherwise exercise any legal interest in it um, and then the second is that these instruments don't determine or establish any legal interest in Pine Point Beach, including but not limited to any ownership by Mr. Gendron, and then likewise by the Gables. So what the, the intent of that language is, th there have been concerns raised um, both by members of the council, members of the public, and members of the Pine Point Neighborhood Association, that by conveying um, deeds uh, that dealt in effect with um, with sand on Pine Point Beach or by getting there that we would, the town would, by adopting these documents, determine definitively who owns the beach. Um, that's not the intent of the documents in any way. Um, and it's not the intent of the documents to do anything other than make very clear that a public path will be maintained to the beach. Um, right, but so, right. but it also doesn't guarantee then that if the ownership is determined to be something different, that there would not actually be access across the beach. Is that true? Perhaps I'm misunderstanding your question, but the easement is perpetual in nature to the beach. Correct, but not a necessarily across the beach determined by the ownership issue. Well, well, the, the, well, the default position is that the public has the right to use and access right. the intertidal yeah. zone, the beach, the sand wet and dry. Right. And so this intends to speak to, um, to answer the question that there are no, we're not implying or providing any private rights. 
we're speaking to the private side of things entirely. So the default position is the public has the right to use the beach and we continue to have that right. So my, my only question, can we incorporate that into the language so it's clear? Well, I mean, we, we can incorporate language that the council feels necessary. I suppose what, what I would say is that the issue the, the issue of beach ownership is is a separate issue completely. Um, under understanding the fact that th this in effect deals with a pathway to the beach, these documents aren't intended in any way to suggest, establish, do anything um, with regards to who owns Pine Point Beach. Um, and I think so. We may have a path to nowhere, to nowhere. That Potentially. But those same issues mm -hmm. exist on every, every property beach. on either side of these two properties. I understand. So I might suggest that this gives us, frankly, a little more clarity, at least for these two properties, than exists elsewhere on the beach. Yeah, and I guess the second. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm okay. And, and, and I guess to your question, though, this covers the right of way. That's, that's what this is addressing. Mm -hmm. uh, the right of way does not necessarily extend down. Uh, to low tide. Right. So what this is saying is uh, the parties involved here who have a claim are agreeing that they will not interfere with the public's right to use that right of way as a public tide, right of way. To get to the high tide line. Right. Now does somebody else have a right to claim some restriction on the public? No one's ever asserted that. So it's you're raising a hypothetical that hasn't really ever been raised. So unless you can identify some other entity that would have a right of claim to restrict the public, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, could, could the last, in our last session, in our last workshop, we discussed this same issue. And we discussed, I think the reason why he's asked, I'm not trying to speak mm -hmm. for you, but I think part of the concern was we talked about the water line and the high tide line and where what that meant and so I think that's why we're asking for some clarity around this. Well this language is because intended to give you concern. comfort around that very issue. Could, could I perhaps speak to that? Do you mind hearing from that story, Brad? Yep. And since I have drafted uh, most of this, the, the, the point we were trying to accomplish is if Mr. Gendron owned the beach he has, through these documents, given the public access to the, to the low water mark. Okay. So if he's the owner, then the public has a perpetual right to get to the beach anywhere it wants to go to. If Mr. Gendron, if the public owns the beach, the public already has that right, and this doesn't take anything away from it. There, we are aware of no one else who has a claim uh, to ownership of the beach in front of Mr. Gendron's property. But since the, the only real suspects are either Mr. Gendron or the public, under this easement, the public is absolutely guaranteed access uh, over the Gendron property to the beach, unless there's some third party out there that nobody knows about who wants to claim the beach. Exactly. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Well, am I crazy? I thought last time we were having a discussion, I thought it was you that said the public had the right to the top, to the water line. Well, but now that's right. changing. No, 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 just, no, no not at all. No, um, no, no. The, the question is the last time we had, there was this gray area about this gives us the right to the high tide mark. Right. It's unclear if Jenner does own the right to the low tide mark. But it isn't given us necessarily clearance unless in that if it is given us clearance, the gender is saying we have access to the low tide mark, but I don't understand why we just don't put it in the document as such. Well, I, I'm, I guess, happy to clarify it if it isn't clear, but um, it was, it is already the intention to say that uh, whether Mr. Gendron owns, if, if Mr. Gendron owns the beach, there's a guaranteed right of access to the beach to the low water mark and the entire beach. So if the public owns it, then the public already <coughs> owns this right, and it does, this document doesn't affect it. It's only if there's some private person out there 
who some and I, some claim to the beach that we don't know anything about. That's the only person who could interfere with yes, this but, document. But you're missing what you just said. I don't read in this document. You, okay. If, if the language, if you're willing to commit. Absolutely. Then can we put that language in this document Absolutely. so it's clear? Absolutely. Okay. That's a, and then my second question becomes, again, it's now on section C when it, it talks about amount of damages to be paid. And it talks about you know, there's the fair market value of the property immediately after the discontinuance will be no less than the fair market value before. But with that, the question before, we've not got a clear answer. There is some significant value to this property. In any way, does this language prevent that property from being assessed its fair market value? No. And so can we put language... Who's saying, yes, saying no? Who's, who's saying this? I thought Tom was waving yes. It does or it does not? I was nodding. I thought it was an insightful question. Oh, okay. Answering. So again, I'd like to make it clear that I mean, I there's been some estimates that some representations been made. There's really going to be no very little difference in the property before and after discontinuance to the two abutters. Two, there is pretty significant market value or assessed value, and I just wanted to be clear that in no way is this market value not different before or after. That there will be some assessed value to that property to both to both the butters that are going to get the property. Right. I, I understand your point and your question and I agree with Tom that that's an insightful question. I can also, what I can say is that the, that section particularly goes to an aspect of this continuance statute that requires the town to award damages to a butters if the discontinuance of the road would in fact decrease I, their, their fair market value. I understand that, but can, my question is can we ask, put in clear language again that implies that there is going to be probably an increase in assessed value to the butters for the, for the property value that, that, that this implies? So by including it, what purpose does that serve? I, I, I've heard there's been representations made to some of the abutters that there'll be no appreciable difference in the property value after this. And so I just want to make Until a subsequent clear. transaction occurs, right? No, no. And I just want to make it clear no, no. That, that the abutters, when they inherit, if we discontinue the streets, yep. that a reasonable expectation is that property is going to be assessed and both abutters will be assessed whatever that value is. And I just want to make it clear in this language so there's no confusion. And if it's not a problem, then I don't understand yeah, why we're saying If there's some confusion about it, it should be clear, but I think a statement needs to be made to comply with the statute. And then in the same sentence or paragraph, you go on to speak to this finding shall in no way have any effect on it and so forth. For the record, it's our understanding that our property would be subject to assessment at fair market value in the opinion of the assessor. Right. Even after the transaction occurs. Right. I mean, it's the way everybody... So if that's clear, all I'm saying is let's just make sure in this document that that is captured so that there's not a question later because I've heard... I understand. But I just wanted to make clear that that is our intention as opposed to somebody, in a sense, forcing us to do it. That's what we always anticipated. Again, I've heard some concerns and it may not be... There's two property abutters here that one of the abutters is concerned about what that increased valuation may mean. So I just want to make it clear that they know as we move through these documents that there is a process in place that they will... Whatever that value is. Right. There's some numbers that suggest it's a significant number. And if it is, then they have to pay it. Well, right. Both parties. That's all I want to make clear. And for me, I would just add to that that what that number is does make a difference in my decision making or it informs my decision making to some degree. And I'll explain that when I give my comments throughout the discussion. But if I'm giving away a piece of land that's worth $20,000 or a piece of land that's worth $300,000 on behalf of the town, I have a duty and a responsibility to the entire town to be prudent in making that decision and knowing what that number is. So I will say right from the get-go, I'm not comfortable acting on this tonight because I don't know exactly what that number is. And that would help me. But there's more to that. But I think we should get to our council discussion probably. Right? Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
you have any questions on the landscape plan? Yep. Um, just to make sure, are there any other questions regarding legal? We still have a half an hour, Will, so I promise. Oh, any other I questions? Was, I thought we were just asking two quick questions, and then I we can come back and ask legal questions. Oh, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody Anybody have, is that the case? Or, no, and I, I, could, I could ask I just questions. move forward. Whatever, whatever you would like to ask. Could, could we just clarify really quick, because it matters to me. Is Mr. Jenner here? Yes. Who? I'm sorry. I've just never met you. I had no idea you were in the audience. So it's just good to know. He's never been here. Ben had mentioned that he's That's why he mentioned it, but I was like, is he here? Is he like a mystery? Because like, I've never seen you at. So thank you. I'm, I'm actually really glad that you are here. So I appreciate that. Uh, with that, Will, you get any questions? We can move in. Uh, I think we can go back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Something from the legal part. We can go back and forth now. Great. Do you have any other questions? Will? I'd like to reserve the right to come back to legal. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So no, I don't have a. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Any questions regarding the schematic and the landscape design um, for the gentleman's here? Yeah, go ahead. No questions. Just a comment. Number one, I'm really uh, grateful and appreciative of uh, all parties being willing to come together and talk through um, some changes that make uh, more people feel a little bit better about the whole thing. Um, that doesn't mean that I necessarily support discontinuance, but uh, I, if, it has, if it has to go forward, then I think it's probably the best planned uh, effort towards that end. So I, I don't see any changes or I don't have any further questions on what's being proposed in terms of that. Could you explain that? What, what, are, the, what are the trees in orange? I mean, are those? Okay, so, so the property line, that's the upper side and that's the lower side, and so that's the whole width. Um, the yellow trees are existing trees uh, that are intended to remain out there. Um, so the last go around, uh, you can see right here where the pathway was staked. So that's the 10 foot easement in the middle uh, for which the, the uh, path meanders in between. So the surveyors went out there and, and within that they put stakes for that 10 foot corridor and they uh, located all the trees within that 10 foot corridor. And as a follow up, I went out there um, and looked at the trees and their condition um, and also kind of identified the additional trees outside of the corridor um, and located the pathway based on my findings of existing um, healthy trees. There's a lot of invasives um, for, the, for the front part of the property which we'd like to remove as part of the um, process. Um, so the yellow represents trees that are in healthy condition and should remain. And that's part of the interest of the Fine Point Neighborhood Association to try to retain some of the canopy of the existing and the character of the existing path. And are any of the native trees being cut down as part of There's a few, uh, there's a couple that are dead um, in, the, in the front part um, where the bittersweet is just kind of taking them down. Um, so they'll be removed. And there's one section of the pathway like right in here where no matter which way we go, you're gonna have to take a couple little small, they're not nothing significant, but smaller um, evergreens down to be able to get through there. And then all the new plantings are very carefully selected uh, native species. Right? For the most part, not 100%, not but for the most part, yes. Um, and you can see, if you follow kind of the green line there, so what, what that's doing is around the existing vegetation that's in the yellow, um, the green planting line is essentially filling in the old corridor of the pathway so that um, it won't still be traveled. It's going to be filled in with, with uh, plantings. Um, and what is the what is the red rectangle that's the red in the, the yeah, packet? So the other week I met with um, with Nick uh, from the Gables, and one thing we did was go out on this neighbor's deck to see what kind of impact the path uh, shift is going to have on them. And it's not significant, but what we did was locate an area where future plantings could happen, um, and I. The ones that I have listed are ones that are on this list. If they wanted different plants than what I've proposed uh, as an option, you know, they could ask the town for that right. But um, he hasn't had a chance to talk with those neighbors to see what their personal interest would be. Uh, so it's just an area that we've reserved the right within his easement inside to uh, do plantings in the future. And then the. the Yellow teas are transplanted trees. Yeah, there's, there's five that are transplanted that are, that are located right on the line where the pathway needs to go on this side. 
Um, so the intention is to move them over uh, within the corridor so, so that the gables will still have that existing buffer that they currently hold, um, but with transplant to plants. One other question. Is, is, the, is the red area or and the acceptable list of plants uh, spelled out in the, in the document in terms of what could actually be planted inside the conservation easement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe, yeah. I believe it's the note right on that plan. Is it right? Mm -hmm. It talks about the species that would be allowed. There's okay. It ties back to eight different guys right in the left hand corner. It ties back to the legend. And incidentally, uh, then if you could clarify this landscape plan, um, it will exist um, as right. an exhibit. Is that correct? So, what would be included, in fact, is the Northeast Civil um, Solutions, which is the engineered plan. That would be included as an exhibit to this discontinuous order. But our understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, John, is that both the landscape plan and the engineered plan would be recorded documents. Well, the landscape plan is an exhibit to both of the easements. Right. So it would be attached to it, it and incorporated in it. And, and there is specific language in both easement documents that if, in the unlikely event that either party, either the Gables or Mr. Gendron, wanted to deviate from this landscape plan at all, that they would have to give notice to the town, who would have the option of saying no. Um, so the intent, of course, is that all of the landscaping and planting would be restrained to this plan, but um, there's an additional buffer, if you will, built in there in case changes needed to be made or wanted to be made. Sorry, can you explain that last part? Sure. sure. So, um, what's spelled out in the easements essentially is that, especially on on the gender and side potentially, that the only activities that are allowed are plantings consistent with this plan, um, and the thought being that if Mr. Gendron, for instance, wanted to plant a different tree in a in a specific spot. Um, that in, instead of just simply allowing him to do that, um, he would keep effectively call the town, um, say... You have to notify them in writing, actually. Notify them in writing. Um, and give the town 30 days. That's correct. 30 days to either accept that um, change or deny that change. Um, so just adding in additional protection um, to ensure that the plan is... Is that, that provision is really anticipated kind of a future change well down the road, which may not involve any of us. It could be 20 years down the road for that matter. Yeah. And that, with the exception of the area in red, is that correct? Well, that, that area is written into the, into the Gables deeds um, as, as an allowable activity for them to plant the type of species that are mentioned in that box. But again, just like the gender inside, if they wanted to plant in a different spot, or plant a different species, then they would still get notice of the town. And they're responsible for that planting? Yes. Okay. Other questions regarding the landscape design or other issues? Any uh, questions regarding legal? Going back to that? Uh, so, I had a question about the like. timeline. When, when is the, uh, when was the, uh, Sorry, the condo association meeting. You said late November. Do we have a? That's our understanding. Yeah. Okay. So my understanding is this last meeting of this body though would be the third Wednesday of November. Yeah, and it's not it's not required to have this body uh, be the one to, to act in final form. But um, just since you've been living with it uh, right along and it was ready for you, we, we brought it before you. And do we do have we established those line up in terms of because they, they would have to meet before then before that would take place. It really comes back to how insistent we are, whether we require all seven condo members to sign off, or uh, if a majority, you know, the, to their normal course of uh, business activities, if a majority of the board or executive committee, mm -hmm. however they um, conduct themselves, um, would be authorized to, to sign these in on behalf of the other owners. If we want to lessen that standard, it's possible that we could get this sooner. Sorry, if I could take one. I want to be, uh, I believe that I have a good understanding of this, but if we agree to this discontinuance, there will be this path in perpetuity. Uh, for, there's nothing that could happen from a legal perspective by either of the two abutters to, to change that. No. It's an, it's, it's an easement. It's an interest in land that is conveyed to the town by both the butters. 
recorded in the registry of deeds and exist in perpetuity. That's the whole point. And also the conservation easement as well. Correct. Yes. Those were just, those new definitions came in so we could better separate exactly the portion that's intended to be the path as opposed to the outside portions that are meant to be conserved and planted. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we don't know if the gables, if we don't get, say they don't get all seven, we don't know yet if, say, two or one, if they vote against it, has any kind of legal recourse? Right. So, again, the original intent, there had been a document we presented to you back in May, which is one that we had fashioned. It's not one that's necessarily required by the statute, but it would still be the town's preference to have a document that acknowledges the discontinuance and acknowledges that everybody in the gables, as well as Mr. Gendron, received adequate notice and is satisfied that they won't be receiving damages as part of this. They would sign and then that would protect against that scenario where there's one condo association member who wanted to go forward and challenge. If it comes down to a situation where we can't feasibly get that document, but the town still wishes to move forward with the discontinuance and the receipt of both easements, that could still be accomplished without that document. Well, let's say at some point in the future there's a future owner of one of these properties and they've decided that they're going to cut down some trees or park a boat there. What is the town's recourse toward? Right. So that presumably, for one, I'm assuming you're talking about the gables? No, no, just hypothetical future owner. What would happen? Well, so it certainly couldn't be located in the public path area because that's restricted to public access only. Within both public conservation areas on either side of the path, activities in there are restricted, again, to the plain things that we see here. And then what's been termed as typical residential activities. That certainly does not include the parking of a truck or a boat. It also can't include building any structure of any kind with the exception of the gables fence on their side. And what's written in both documents is that if that were to occur, the town could either order them to remove that structure and remediate, or if they didn't do that, the town could either itself go in or hire a contractor to fix that and then bill that homeowner. So the short answer to your question is the town can fix it and then force that landowner to pay. Great. Thank you. Kate, did you have something? I got it covered. Thank you. Oh, okay. Go. Would it be appropriate to have it clear that the storage of personal property is not a customary use or whatever the language was? Sure. I think that had been raised at a previous meeting. I think the only practical challenge is we attempted to set a clear standard of what was acceptable and what isn't, and it doesn't make much sense to list, for instance, 50 separate activities that are permitted and not permitted. But if the storage of personal property is not permitted, I don't see why that couldn't be written in as something that's not specifically allowed. Do we have a list articulated of what is not allowed? Or can we just say these are the things that are allowed and therefore anything else is not? It's termed typical residential activities, which is light recreation, light horniculture. Essentially, it's meant to mean that if someone living in the Gables or living in Mr. Gendron's property were to have kids out playing soccer or kicking a ball around or planting flower beds, again, if they were allowed by the plan, we didn't want to expressly preclude somebody from doing that. But if the council wants language written in there that specifically excludes the storage of personal property, I don't see why that would be fine to me at least. Other questions? So the next step is, and it's kind of our chance to talk amongst ourselves in a way, is what is our next step? Is there a preference to begin that process this evening so that we can have a public conversation outside of a workshop? It seems like, at least from my perspective, we have some time to be able to 
um, had multiple conversations on the record um, around this. Um, so the question I have is, um, how do you want to proceed? Because I would need to know in order to be able to um, adjust the agenda this evening if the desire is to begin the process tonight so that we can then schedule one, if not maybe two public hearings. Nothing says we can't do two since we've got the time. Um, and, you know, and if anyone wants to share concerns that need to be considered regarding the language, I think that uh, Pete has brought up a couple of specific points um, that are being taken into consideration. I'm not sure if Bill's was definitive in wanting some language or not regarding the personal property, um, but this is an opportunity, I guess, as us as counselors to express anything else that should be considered by staff and legal um, as well as the parties um, so that we can um, decide what our next step is. So with that, I'm just going to open it up to conversation. Um, we have about 10 minutes. Go ahead, Bill. Well, well, certainly. I mean, I think the inclusion of things that Peter sought clarification on and which are in dispute yeah. are things that ought to be made part of the documentation. Uh, I think when you think of light recreational use, okay, but the storage of vehicles, <coughs> we would all we would all say no. So that's why I would think that language might appropriately go in. Yeah, go, going back and reading the, the section, I think it doesn't make sense to add that the storage of vehicles is prohibited. For the record, we had volunteered to do that, and then uh, the rest of the parties decided we didn't need to. Um, so we're on the same wavelength. Yes. Well, because it's a conservation yeah. easement, so right. it ought to really remain in pretty much a pristine condition. And so, yeah. well, somebody can play there, because uh, people are going to be passing through and playing catch, and that that's all fine, but the, the nature of the property needs to remain pristine. Yeah, and I think it'd be part of somebody's drive. Yeah. I think Peter was next. And then Peter? Yeah, it's just a good question. I guess a little confused. I just want to circle back. So as it relates to the, to the Gables condominiums, what we don't know is where they are at this point in time, correct? I mean, they don't have their meeting until right. November. We don't know if it will be a 7 vote or a 5-7 vote or whatever. So I'm a little uncomfortable doing anything because if, if, if they don't agree to it, then aren't we back to square one or we're back to a different place? So I'm just, you know, we can spend a lot of time talking about this, but it seems to me a critical link is to find out where they are so then we can continue the process and the conversation. Right now it just seems like it's a, it's a wild card on what that answer is going to be. So I'm little, little, is that, is that a fair assessment, I guess, is the question. Do we know? Well, I obviously can't speak for them. I, I do know that it was communicated to us through their president um, that he is supportive and he has mm -hmm. the sense that um, their executive board will be supportive. Right. Um, and he'll be recommending support. Though. Right. But, I mean, they've had time to kind of poll their group. And it right. sounds like they haven't polled the group so they know... So I, I guess that's my only point. We can spend a lot of time spinning our wheels talking about it, but if they vote no, then we kind of start over again. So I, I don't see the harm at this point of maybe tabling it until after the meeting and then come back and have the conversations we need to have. That's, that's mm -hmm. just where I am. The, the only thing I could interject to that is that it is a, it is a three-step process. And so there is nothing... I. I certainly understand the discomfort and, and and do acknowledge that if they do not approve their easement, then that does that does uh, cause a lot of challenges. Yeah, that but, the, but, but the answer, the three-step process, if we vote to discontinue the street, then, then we've kind of put our foot in the sand, we've made a, a, and it's hard to go back, so why don't we, I would rather have all the information available to us so we can make the best decision we can make a decision tonight to discontinue the street, kind of put something in motion with some unknown. So I'm, I'm more conservative than not. I'd rather wait till we have the complete picture, have all the information in front of us, and then make a very informed decision about what's the best pathway. I'm just not comfortable doing that tonight. That's just and my that's position. And that's specifically what you want right now. It's just timeline and <coughs> not necessarily all of our commentary because we've never had a 10-minute conversation. Right. Um, so I do need to clarify something, Peter, if the Senate stands that while well, it's a three-step process, it's one motion that starts because all three parts are in the same motion. So um, 
that would, if, if that happened, that would occur either tonight or at some other meeting, and then you'd have a public hearing. So um, I just wanted to share that um, I understand because that's the only consternation that I have is about what does this create if at the end. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me personally, though, is that I, I am not troubled by starting the process because I think that we need to have a public hearing um, even before because that public hearing may actually cost us to, to, to stop this on our own regardless of what the outcome is. So having one, if not two, during the process until that happens, to me is okay because at some point there will be a decision to simply stop it and then we have to deal with the issues at the end. Um, so it's just, we're starting at a different point, but I think we have the same concern in the end. Um, so I, I'm comfortable at least personally moving it forward as long as we have those public hearings because I think that there are, um, uh, we will get a lot of comments on this and I'd like to hear that before the end um, that happens. And, and I hope that between now and some point, we should be able to get at least a um, legal opinion about, based on their uh, association, what is the legal position that is at least the minimum, because then our decision, I think we need to make a decision before that final hearing too, is that what is our acceptance level? Is it that it must be unanimous or is it that it's legal limit? Um, so I'd like to, uh, personally, that's why I'd like to move this forward so that we can then get that and make a kind of a determination in that. Uh, Katie, you were next. Um, well, so, I mean, as I think I stated back in May, you know, my kind of personal position on this is that this is really an issue that the council does, is not obligated to act on at all. Uh, there's no reason why we have to go forward other than we've been approached by abutters who are asking us to take a look at it uh, and, you know, perhaps uh, proactively rather than uh, in a courtroom. But the truth is, unless we were in a courtroom, and a judge told us who actually owns the property, that's, that's when we would have to take an action one way or the other. I understand and appreciate, you know, why we're taking some of the proactive approach, and I do appreciate the collaborative process that has occurred. My preference in terms of the timing piece, though, would be that we had at least before, I'm okay moving it forward, um, because we will have a lot of opportunity for discussion, um, so it could move forward tonight. Uh, but I'd want to know three things. I'd want a guarantee that we can have at least two public hearings, not one, uh, as you said, because it, sometimes it gets folded into one, and I think this is a, a topic that would require uh, enough opportunity for people to, to come and talk to us. I'd want to know the, am the amount that, and, and I think it's fair to the abutters, for them to know what the amount of the reassessed value is. I know you've got some kind of preliminary numbers potentially, but that's better than nothing, and I appreciate the work that you did on that. Um, and I'd also want to know from the Gable. That's the same you know, concern that I was always had. On the issue of value, I, I don't believe, I understand the interest, but I don't believe that I can deliver that. It's not a, that I'm being obstinate. It's, it's the call of an assessor. Um, and at this point, I don't have an assessor that's going to be able to produce that number. So I know you mentioned that that number is important to you at the front end, but what's certainly true is there will be some value considerations, and the assessor will make that call where appropriate. And what that value is is purely independent because we have no say in him assessing any value on any property. No. Right? Okay. Anything else? I'm sorry, Will, you were anything? Yeah, so um, I, I would be uncomfortable moving the issue tonight um, because it wasn't on our published agenda, and I feel like there's a lot of public interest in um, in this issue, and it kind of sets to Peter's point to the ball in motion um, that uh, I'd like to be uh, publicly announced ahead of time. I know we had the workshop on tonight, but I, I would just be concerned about um, the... Um, at least the perception that, that we weren't interested in the public opinion before taking action. Um, and then my other point in response to um, Council Soli's comments was just like, I think that, that um, while we're not obligated to take action, I feel like we're, what we're being presented with is an opportunity to permanently preserve a spot where if this were decided in a courtroom, it may not be an option for us. If, if it's decided against our interest, we could lose that path forever. Any other comments or considerations? Well, it sounds like there's a, a few little language changes that we're talking about, but which probably are not contentious, and and uh, and so the timeline would look like uh, a uh, termination of, of the town's rights 
put forward on the agenda, published agenda, at the second meeting in October with the opportunity for public uh, hearings during the first two meetings in November, the two meetings in November. And then the Condo Association has its annual meeting at the end of November, which would afford us plenty of time to determine if it's unanimous, that's fine. If it's not, then council will give us advice as to whether it be prudent to proceed in the face of one, two, or three individual owners not agreeing to this. And that would all be resolved in the first meeting in December. That looks like the timeline to me. Comments, Kate? I just, I think I share a lot of the same concerns that most of you do. I mean, I, I'm, I'm uh, very uncomfortable with not having more information from the Gables. Um, I do like the fact that we're talking about two um, times for public comment. I think that's important. I think we have to stay the course that we've been going from the beginning, which is we open this up to the public for their input, and we've got to keep that going all the way through. Um, I think it would be extremely irresponsible to change that at this point. Um, as for you know voting on it tonight, I could go either way. It doesn't really matter to me at this point because really at the end of the day, I I could I could tell you tonight how I'm going to vote if if the gate hold is at seven. Right. So procedurally, if I understand uh, council rules, so I need I, I need a clear consensus here because I'm not going to set us up <coughs> for failure. Um, if we have a first reading tonight that fails, the only way that it can be re brought back up is by someone who voted in the negative. Right. Um, otherwise, it is dead for a year. So the only way to have a public hearing is that it moves forward and that we have the first reading tonight. That doesn't obligate us to an outcome in the end, but I don't want to set us up and then have it fail and then take us down a different path. So I just, I really need a clear... Just to be clear, clear, it's not a first reading. Um, mm -hmm. This is actually to order the discontinuance. Right. And it actually requires counselors to, to sign that order. But I, my, my understanding is that it would be amended to include a public hearing, correct? No, it's required to have a public hearing. You're required to have a public hearing. Yes. You could have additional ones, and it sounds like right. you wish to. Uh, I would just say Councilor Rowan talked me right into because it was not on the agenda, and we, that has been consistent mm -hmm. feedback we have heard on a multitude of issues uh, that I would not be comfortable moving it forward tonight. Thank you. So that's two. First time. Three. I can't win when I put uh, something I, on I the agenda. You come for early up. No, I'm not. We get criticized okay. when we don't. So, so with that input, I'm not going to advance this as an adjustment to tonight's agenda. Tom, pardon. Um, based on what I just heard, um, although. Um, those hard keeping track, and I'm not putting it forward. Fair enough. Okay. So that's it. I just uh, would observe it as a challenge for me. Um, normally, I would put something on the agenda to preserve the option, and you can yep. dispense with it, table it, do whatever you wish. Uh, in this case, I chose not to. So yep. I appreciate yeah. the way you did. Yep. So with that, we only have a couple of minutes. So I'm waiting for try. Um, um, and I apologize to the citizens for comment, but what we'll do is that we can have comment at the uh, top since it's not going to be on the agenda. Um, citizens can speak on the item at the public comment section. So I apologize for not having the time at the end. So with that, we'll just adjourn to our um, regular meeting. Or going to our regular meeting. Thank you, everybody.
Good evening, folks. Sorry we're starting a little late. Um, I, did, I was trying to send a reminder. If I could ask all the councilors, if they can bring the microphone down a little bit. Um, some citizens have mentioned that it's very difficult to hear people because of how they station that. So uh, during the evening, if you can think about that, that'd be great. Um, with that, call to order. Um, it's a little after 7 o'clock. This is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Uh, we just came out of a workshop regarding Avenue 2 that you'll get an update on later as well. Um, moving into uh, Pledge of Allegiance, if you please rise and join me. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Roll call. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Chairman Bayvine? Present. Uh, moving on to item number five. Um, uh, sorry, item number four is general public comments. If there's anybody that would like to get up and speak uh, on any item that's not on our agenda, you're welcome to um, come to the podium. If you could please give your name and address. If you live in another town, the town is fine. I'm Susan Hamill. Can you bring that down? Sorry. Susan Hamill, and I live on Bay Street in Pine Point. Um, I want to talk about a couple things. First, um, I have been involved in the, um, in the Pine Point Neighborhood Association, and um, we were brought into the discussions on um, the discontinuance of Avenue 2. And we very much uh, appreciate uh, being included and being able to participate um, I thought that the entire process um, 
was very, uh, it, it really was quite constructive. We came out with a better outcome than we would have, at least we feel that, that um, if the street is going to be discontinued, um, the path and, uh, that we will wind up with is, um, it's, a, it's a good outcome for the, for the public. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the sign ordinance, um, which has just gone into effect. And I've done some research on how the state and town um, ordinances on temporary signs only work together. Both the state and the town require ID information, the name of the person or the organization who posts a sign, and our town requires a phone number. The state requires dates of posting. So when you can put a sign up, when you've got to take it back down. And the town is responsible to enforce both the state and the town ordinance. So most of the temporary signs that we've been seeing all around um, in the right-of-way, in the public right-of-way, have in fact been illegal. They do not, most of them do not have dates or phone numbers or the name of the orga organization that posted the sign. And um, and that's the Scarborough Mattress Fundraiser, the Scarborough Travel Basketball, all of the Help Wanted, uh, Lumber Liquidators, Help Wanted by the Marsh, H&R Block, Tax Class. So I have concerns that as we're entering the election season, if we're not going to enforce um, or we're only going to enforce political signs, that concerns me. So that's the first thing. Um, the second item I wanted to talk about was the tax abatement. Um, I spoke at the last council meeting asking for some clarification on the range of town exposure for the upcoming tax abatement case. And um, at that time, our town manager said he needed more time to review the material um, which had been submitted to the court. We know that, that the minimum amount the town will be paying is 463000 as the voters right now are being asked to consider a $20 million bond issue, in the interest of transparency and as a show of good faith, I'm asking our town manager and town council to provide some information on the abatement so that we voters will, can make an informed decision. What is the range that best and worst case that we're looking at? I have heard that it could be as high as $4 million. So um, that's really concerning. And I'd like to know. I mean, that's a rumor. Um, let's get some facts out there. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Stephanie Keene, and I uh, started a business uh, 24 years ago I'm in sorry, Scarborough. I'm sorry to if you can also give your address if you're a resident of Scarborough or the city. My the current address is now Buxton, Maine. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm here with probably 20 other local horse people to uh, bring up the idea that uh, I guess we weren't really informed. Uh, we've been holding permits since permits came uh, into the system. I think that was eight years ago. I'm not even 100% sure of that, of uh, getting permits for horses to ride on the beach. Um, and uh, we didn't realize that there was going to be something put through, or a lot of us didn't anyways, of uh, the horse containment systems, as a lot of us are not residents of Scarborough that do use the beach for horse purposes. Um, we uh, have looked into the new thing that you guys passed, and we did go to Old Orchard last night, and um, they threw the issue out on their end. Um, and we're coming forth to ask you to reconsider um, your stance on having the manure bags system um, put into the process of um, getting a permit for the horses for the beach for this year. Um, as, you know, a horse person for 40 years, um, that's not something you can train your horse to overnight. And 99% uh, of saddle horses have not been exposed to having a uh, harness type system like that that's going to carry approximately 15 pounds of manure hitting them in behind the butt when it falls out. So uh, being that we can now ride on the beach, uh, we don't have time to A, purchase those. They run from 60 to $200, and we do not have time to train our regular stable horses to uh, accept that as a, as a um, 
device uh, to protect the manure. Uh, we're under the understanding that Old Orchard Beach had one complaint last year about horse manure, and we're also under the understanding that Scarborough had one complaint. So uh, I guess as a horse community, we're kind of viewing that as a non-issue. We think we police ourselves pretty darn well down there as far as cleaning up the parking lot and then the pathway down to the high tide line. Um, horse manure is organic compost. I think a lot of people kind of miss that. Uh, people come to my farm on a weekly basis, get horse manure, mix it in their vegetable garden, mix it in their you know, uh, rose bushes and that type of thing. There is no huge bacterial component to horse manure. Um, it's of organic nature. Uh, so we're asking if the town could reconsider this movement and uh, possibly either give us a year to get our horses trained to this and the financial funds to be able to purchase such equipment, um, which could be a significant amount of money to some people, um, and hoping that you guys would just look at that and, and possibly reconsider. Uh, again, we did talk last night at Old Orchard and they tabled it and threw it out. So we can park at the Old Orchard Beach and the percentage of Scarborough that's actually uh, oceanfront is small compared to uh, riding either, you know, on at Old Orchard and heading right to the pier or coming left in this direction. So we're hoping that you guys could think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Nora Healy. I live in Freeport. I'm a Freeport resident. I'm a lawyer. I started horseback riding just a few years ago at Flaherty Equestrian Center in Scarborough, and I echo Stephanie's comments. Um, I'd just like to add that at, in Freeport, I'm also on the Freeport Shellfish Commission. So I've been on the Shellfish Commission for a little over 10 years, and we spend a lot of time dealing with water quality issues, and I know you have to face those in Scarborough as well. Um, but as Stephanie noted, horse manure is very different from, for example, dog manure, and um, where dog waste can present serious water quality issues, those are not present with horse manure. So I think, um, you know, I'm late to the party here. We are not in more of the discussions you've had when you passed this, um, but it, in my view, and there's science to back this up, we can share some articles up with you if you'd like, it's really not a health and safety issue. What we're talking about here is a visual impact and only a visual impact, and it's a really limited visual impact. I think. Um, as Stephanie indicated, you know, most horse owners are responsible and, are, and clean up after their horses. Like everyone, um, there are times when you know, someone ruins it for everyone else, but I think we can do more around enforcement to address this issue if it is a real issue. And um, as Stephanie noted, there are real hardships to um, adding these manure containment devices. So we would ask you to reconsider and perhaps put it on your agenda for the next town council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Vosky and I am a resident. I'm down on Driftwood Lane, down at Pine Point. I also am fortunate enough to have a horse. And um, I do love to ride my horse on the beach. And uh, as a resident, I'm not a full-time resident, I'm a, a part-time resident here. I was not aware of the change either. I don't get mail here. I spent a couple of hours with uh, Ms. Crockett this afternoon to figure out how I could be better informed. And we discussed that issue, uh, and I'm now on the uh, email newsletter, I guess, from the town. <clears throat> so that'll help. But the thing is, I did call the dog officer. I called the police. There was not one single complaint about horses in the last year in the town of Scarborough. I live five houses up from the parking lot, from Heard parking lot. I have never once gone by and seen horse poop. And I do go around the trailers because I'm very often looking for my friends, especially before I had a, a trailer of my own. I do find saddles there. I find bridles there. And uh, as everybody has said, horses eat hay and water. That's it. You know, the occasional apple, the occasional carrot. You know, so it, the compost is really very different. What we try to do with the horses is we try to ride them at low tide on the water line. The horses, though, a lot of them are afraid to get their feet wet, just like dogs. They don't like it when the tide comes up and then it goes back out. They all look down to see if their feet are still there. And I guess I would give you the analogy that to ask us to get a poop bag, and by the way, there are none for sale in the state of Maine. Um, you can only get them online. 
You can get them through Amazon, but I guess they come with five or six different straps. None of us have even seen them. And a lot of us have been talking. They come with five or six different straps. So what you have to do is, in picture trying to do this to your dog, okay, but a horse is a thousand pounds, the average horse. You have to lift up the tail, you have to arrange the straps, and then the bag somehow, when they poop, is the poop is supposed to go into the bag. We still haven't figured out how that happens. Now, the other thing is that horses are flight animals, and like I said, they're a thousand pounds. A lot of us are a little older. The average person, 68% of the people riding horses today are over the age of 40. Okay, so you've got a horse, just like you have a dog, and you're trying to say, okay, now walk with this thing hitting you for every single step. And then if they poop, then you've got more weight in it. So they feel they're being attacked. So now this is an animal that could take you down the road at 30 to 40 miles an hour and run for 10 miles. You know, and this is nothing that any of us want to see happen to us. So it, we figure our horses are not school horses. A lot of them are adopted and rescued off of the uh, racetrack here. And I mean, that's the last thing somebody needs is to get an off the track racehorse and give them 10 miles of each, you know, and, and a bag whacking them. So <laughs> it doesn't sound like a calm afternoon. It's not what we had in mind. And uh, so I guess I would, I would say, you know, the reality of the situation is that you think you're, you know, you think you're trying to accommodate some of your residents and we're here going, oh my God, now what do we do? And so now we're back here again and saying, you know, if it's going to take us six months to a year, okay, to train our horses after we get the bags and some of them are not going to be able to be trainable to this. And, um, and then, it's, and then we've also heard that they actually only work 30 to 50 percent of the time. So I mean, we've got all this going, and if people, I, I, people pick up after their horses, they really do. To be a mommy is a poopy business, no matter what the species is. And we're all very careful. We do this all day, every day, wherever we are with our horse. So it's not a big deal, and we do do it. I've never once seen poop just hanging around. Yep, the only place is, sorry, I'm so okay. long-winded. Um, I don't do work well with brothers. Uh, is when you, when you ride around the low tide line, the horses will poop when they get nervous, and then the tide washes it away. And we don't have a lot of swimmers up here, you know, between October and May. So that's my spiel. I'd like you to reconsider. And uh, from now on, I guess I'll be reading that newsletter and showing up when I'm supposed to. Thank you. Just to remind everyone, we do. Uh, there is a three-minute time limit. Yep. So and I will yep. be. Uh, my just want to make sure everyone yep. gets a chance. My name is Pam Dillon. I am a resident here. I have been a permitted, a horse permit person. Uh, I'll make it quick, brief. Um, I do live in Old Orchard. I do live in Scarborough. Um, I grew up in Old Orchard. I live at 43 Beechridge Road. Um, I would be willing personally to give anybody my my cell phone number, and if they got a complaint, I would jump in my truck and I would go down and I would take care of the mess. Just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Cindy Flaherty, and I have been a lifetime resident of Scarborough as well as a lifetime beach rider. Um, I own, well, I run Flaherty Equestrian Center in Scarborough and work at Flaherty's Farm. It's where I've lived my whole life. Um, and so I was also unaware of this, um, this new change until one of my students went and picked up an application, brought it home, and sent me a picture of it and said, did you know this is in there? And I said, no, I didn't. I knew that there was an article that went out back in May that said it may be up for discussion, but that is as much as I had heard about it. Um, I also just wanted to point out that it has not been updated on the website at all. Um, it still has last year's application and there's nothing about the new changes. Um, and the only other note that I wanted to add, I think everyone's done a pretty good job tonight and I don't want to take up too much time, um, is horse manure is a solid waste excluded from the federal EPA solid waste regulation because it neither contains significant amounts of hazardous chemicals nor exhibits hazardous characteristics. So, and that's available um, for anyone to look up. It's not like dog poop. It's not like human poop. Um, it's very different. I also have several um, questionnaires 
um, from local trainers asking if they feel that a poop containment device is a piece of normal everyday equipment used for riding horses and the 100% consensus is no, it's not. It's something that our horses all, be need, all need to be trained uh, for. And um, also, do you feel that a poop containment device can be put on any typical riding horse without training and expect a safe ride? And also, the general consensus is absolutely not. Um, so I hope you would can reconsider that so that we may all ride this year on the beach. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katie. I live at um, Dino Drive in Scarborough. Um, I'm also here about the horse issue and just stressing that obviously we've all kind of hit all the topics, but that it isn't, you know, toxic or anything like that. We do a very good job trying to pick it up and keep up with everything. Um, I've been holding a permit riding here since I was a very little kid. <laughs> um, and I personally own a horse that would probably never be able to have a containment system behind them. So by enforcing this and not giving me time to train, I wouldn't be able to safely ride there any longer. Thank you. Katie, just for the record, so that we can put it in the minutes, what's your last name? Flaherty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Bridget Shorey. I live at 8 Huntley Drive, and I've been riding on the beach for approximately 18 years. And um, everyone has done a great job um, explaining, but I just wanted to mention that um, Popham Beach, Goose Rocks, and Biddeford Pool not only do not require a permit, but they also do not require a poop bag. And I just wanted to thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Caroline Rodrigue. I live at 7 Heather Lane here in Scarborough. I am a horse owner. I don't ride myself, but my daughter is a rider, and uh, I am nicknamed the Pooper Scooper because oftentimes I walk the beach with them, and I'm in charge of uh, pooping the, um, scooping the poop. <laughs> um, the new dimension that I would like to bring is oftentimes, since I'm not on my horse, um, I get stopped all the time by local, by residents, by tourists that tells me how beautiful it is to see a horse riding on the beach. Most of people often they have never seen a horse canter galloping on the beach, and it adds, I believe it adds a lot to our town. I've had a tourist stopping me say, I cannot believe how lucky you are to live in a town where you can ride horses. Some people pay big prices to visit a town, a city, uh, uh, to be able to ride a horse, to rent a horse and be able to ride on the beach. So. I would like, you know, I'm supporting my friends here and other riders, and I would like you to con reconsider uh, how lucky we are uh, to be able to ride uh, our horse on the beach. Thank you. Hey, this is Nora again. I have copies of the article that Cindy referenced uh, regarding the lack of toxicity with uh, horse manure, and I'm willing to leave them here if anyone would like to take one. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Yes. I'm Susan Hamill. I, wa I walk and run the beach. And I probably have photos of almost everyone who was up here tonight to speak on behalf of, you know, I am that person. Um, and I have photos of, I, of all the horses and the manure. And I'd be happy to send that out to anybody. And if I could get the phone number of the person who says that they'd be happy to come down and clean it up, I'll take it. Thanks. Thank you. Any other public comments? <laughs> Hello, Brian, Pondview Drive. I'm not here to talk about poop. <laughs> um, hi. Hi. Yes, um, it's High Guess Parkway, and um, an easy way to remember that might be down south we say, hey, you know, hi, hey, you doing? Up here we say, hi, how you doing? You know, so it's High Guess. Um, I know that sounds minute, but it really drives townies here crazy, kind of like Al Roker saying banger <laughs> to Mainers, you know. Um, The um, pickleball thing is underway, as I understand, and 
I'm just wondering, um, it's been a common complaint that I've heard in the last couple of years as far as um, seniors being able to park down there in the parking lot at the town park just to be able to walk around because during sporting season um, a lot of the parents and a lot of the students park there so you know e the seniors and even single homeowners or anyone that wants to walk their dog or isn't involved in school activities they can't get a parking spot because as you know they're limited um, so that's one thing to think about as these pickleball courts are underway um, the other thing is um, the comprehensive plan of Palooza that you had last week, um, not everyone was able to go, you know, to a lot of those. Um, it, it's been mentioned that uh, perhaps some sort of survey should be put out to more citizens, and then um, the thing I heard was, well, it's, it cost. Um, a couple of ideas to, to sway that cost would be to maybe put it in the community services bulletin, a page in there that people could fill out and mail back, providing their own postage. Um, another idea is to put in a, something similar in the, the Scarborough Leader uh, for four or $500. I think you can get a half a page ad and with, with all the money that we spend on different types of, I don't know, whatever you call it, planning surveys this and surveys that you know, thousands, I think 400 is a drop in the bucket for something as important as citizen feedback from more than 6 or 7 percent of the population here in town. Um, the other thing is, um, as you all are aware, I've sent numerous emails over the past two weeks of now under this new sign ordinance, all the illegal signs, including, um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunate now, that this new ordinance is underway, Lions Club. Um, a lot of the help wanted signs are illegal now. Real estate signs are all illegal that don't have phone numbers and names on them. Um, yard sale signs, and you know, that's, that's kind of a shame. To, and I have the same concerns as Susan Hamill about enforcement on strictly political signs and not the rest of them. What's good for one is good for the rest, and all the rules should apply. So, thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Fortier, and I have horses in Scarborough. And I was just concerned because she's got pictures, but are these pictures of the horse poop below the tide line where it's fine for that to go out, or are they not? And where are they, and how many complaints other than hers have you had? That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, sorry, anybody else that would like to speak on any item that's not on tonight's agenda? Not seeing any. Um, I did want to answer a couple of questions um, just for clarification since we had so many people here to talk about the horse permit um, and what I um, kind of interpret council rules to um, allow and not allow based upon the passage. So just for clarification, the council, the timeline for the activity that the council took this up was it was first brought forward on May 5th to the Town Council's Ordinance Committee, which was posted and advertised. There was also an article in our local paper, the Scarborough Leader, on May 24th. The Ordinance Committee then had an additional public hearing and, uh, or at least public comments and their work on June 5th. On July 19th was the first reading in which it was publicized in the town that the item was um, being brought forward. Um, on August 16th, we had a public hearing in which it was published. And then on September 6th was the actual date of our approval. If I interpret council rules properly, um, too much time has elapsed since that approval for us to be able to do a reconsideration. However, if a councilor wishes to bring that forward either through the ordinance or on their own, they can do so so long as the amendment or the change is substantive in nature in comparison to what was originally approved. Um, so um, we can't just reconsider it um, like other councils have based on our rules, but there is an opportunity if a councilor so chooses uh, to bring that forward 
Um, and it could be anyone, even if you voted in the, um, voted against it or voted in the minority uh, vote. So I just wanted to kind of make that clear so the citizens had some expectations about what can and can't happen because it's not just a simple uh, reconsideration. And I did want to mention also that there was a reference that the um, online um, source is not updated. The clerk was able to verify it and it is actually out there. If you go online to the town's site and go through the town clerk's button and that is on the left, and then scroll to the bottom, there is a horse permit section in which the documents are available online for you. So um, I just wanted to at least get that out to the citizens because generally after we have that many speakers, a lot of them take off and won't hear it when I can bring it up later. So I hope that helps uh, the citizens that were able to be here tonight. Um, with that, uh, moving on to order num um, sorry, item number five, which is our acceptance of our minutes from September 20th, the regular meeting. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Is there any um, edits, modifications, or corrections for the clerk? Not seeing any. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Thank you. That's, um, that's um, unanimous. <coughs> Adjustments to the agenda. I do have one item to adjust, um, and it will be under non-action items. Um, and the verbiage, and I'll explain when we get to that point, because I've already spoken with, uh, with Marge, uh, or the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Um, I'm going to be moving that report down to item B and under item A it will be a public notice of the creation of an outstanding municipal volunteer services award program and I'll explain that when we get to that item later um, well actually it's coming up next um, I'll sign the treasurer's warrants as we move along moving into item number eight non-action items under A it is this public notice of a creation for the outstanding municipal volunteer services award so this is, um, we got a little bit of the cart before the horse, uh, no pun intended, giving our friends um, that we're here tonight, but last evening um, I had the pleasure of announcing that um, as a council and as a town, I should say as a town because it was in conjunction and partnership with the manager, we have created an outstanding municipal volunteer services award. Um, and we made that first award last night. Um, that award, the criteria, at least to get it started, is very simple. We really wanted to start from a, what I would call a happy point. There's a lot of um, things that go on in this town that um, we often start the conversation from something negative. And the one thing that is truly valuable and truly happy is the amount of volunteerism that we receive on the municipal side. It's not just the other organizations that are in town, but these are the men and women who spend a lot of time, talent, and treasure in coming to um, board meetings in which they are not compensated, they're not elected. There are many men and women who serve on multiple boards, um, and it was, I thought that it was really something that we should start. Um, the council as a whole, through different committees, have talked about this for at least three years, and I thought that this was a perfect opportunity given the first recipient's um, timeline as far as uh, where he is in uh, kind of his uh, volunteerism. The criteria uh, to get it started can change, but at least to get it started, I kept it simple. Um, it absolutely cannot be a person who has been or who has or currently is an elected official, which excludes school board members, town council members, sanitary district, Portland Water District, um, and if I didn't say sc and school board, if I didn't say that earlier. Um, and then the other pieces are really um, kind of qualitative and can be <coughs> kind of amended as the council takes this up. And I am going to recommend that the, the appointments committee. Uh, take this up and, and put a little bit more formality to it, but I'm putting it on tonight's agenda so that it becomes at least formal. Um, what the purpose of this is to really um, recognize a person who has exemplified what volunteerism is and what stewardship is. And the person that was selected was actually um, unanimously selected by the council. Um, it was a full agreement based upon the longevity of the service to the community. Um, he is, um, I get, the, the story I have to tell is the first time I met him was in probably, I think it was 2002 or three. I just got elected to the council. Um, I went to the chairman who was Mark Maroon, who's now the chair of the ZBA, was chair actually before even back then, and said, I really want to change the way we communicate on cable television and would love to do some type of uh, political, um, but apolitical uh, show about the local election. He said, I've got this great guy that will do it. Before I knew it, he came to the cable TV group said, I want a camera, I want to go on the road, I'm, I'm going to hit the uh, school department on election day and see if I can get some interviews. And we came back here. Now keep in mind, this is before social media, it's before email, um, it's before a lot of things. And uh, he did an incredible job in which we had Mark and I were back here talking about politics and being balanced. We had 
So this was just one, start, one way in which he started. <clears throat> and over the years, he has served on many building committees, most recently as chair of the Public Safety Building. Um, he has been a constant presence at our Chamber Candidates Night, in which he's been the moderator even after he left the Chamber of Commerce, in which he was the chairman and president of the Chamber. Um, and um, he's also been on several other boards, including most recently as the chairman of SEDCO, in which he's remaining on SEDCO, but um, he is um, at least uh, giving up the chairmanship. So uh, last evening at the SEDCO annual board meeting, we recognized uh, Kevin Freeman from Scarborough as our first award recipient. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted an opportunity for other counselors, since I got to speak last night, to have other counselors to also speak. Um, so Kevin is here. So Kevin, if I can invite you to come up and face the, uh, face the crowd. With that, is there any comments from counselors? Council Donovan. Well, um, it was the perfect choice as a starting point. And I'm glad the chair uh, grabbed the bull by the horns. Uh, this is a wonderful idea. Uh, Kevin, I've seen him perform at numerous tasks, and he is always the consummate leader. He's composed, he's balanced, he's respectful to everyone, and we couldn't have a better first recipient. And he's very funny. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Rowan. So I, I, I have the uh, pleasure of serving as the liaison to the SEDCO board, for which Kevin's been chair for a number of years. And I, I would say he runs that board to uh, like a, a Swiss watch. Um, and uh, I really appreciate all that you do for the town, Kevin. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. Other comments? Yes, ma'am. He gives really good hugs. <laughs> he does. I'm not going to lie. Um, uh, I'm lucky because I've worked with you on numerous projects, and um, I know that when the safety public building safety board came up, um, number one, I was hopeful that you were going to jump on board, and you did. And you didn't just do just that. Um, you came into the meeting, and it was you're just a born leader. And I actually said to um, Kevin last night, we were talking about some other things, and he didn't know about the award yet, but I said, you know, I mean, you could dump all these things and run for council. I mean, you know, we could use you. Um, and he didn't really jump at that, but I don't know why. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I've never worked with someone so easy to um, talk to, communicate to, with. Um, he's accepting of everybody and everything. And I just think that you make this town a shining place to be. And I just, I don't think that anybody could say enough good things about you, Kevin, really. And, and the thing that I love about you, um, and you, you possess something that few people do that do what you do, um, you're very humble. And you, even when it's your time to shine, you still sit back and you let other people do their thing. And that is a quality that I wish more people had and you possess it to the core. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Counselor? Yeah, it, it kind of, you know, kind of echo in everything you've already heard, but, you know, similarly I've had the pleasure of working with you on the Public Safety Committee and, and also on all the other times, whenever we have a need in town or we need someone to facilitate and help us move through issues, we always seem to call on you and you always step forward. So thank you and great leadership style and thanks, thanks for giving your time so freely to the town. It's made a huge difference. So well-deserved and look forward to continuing to, to partner with you. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Rowan. I, I think the other thing that we didn't mention last night was he also chaired the, uh, or uh, been the MC of the budget forum yeah. for a number yeah. of Oh, that's right. Like <laughs> such, <laughs> such, a, like such a pleasant <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. He blocked that one out. Right? I mean, <laughs> and the candidate forum. And yeah. the candidate forum, yeah. yeah. Any other comments? The only thing I want to add, um, if you can express to your wife, Michelle, being oh. able to do what we do, all of us, depends on an incredible family and partnership with our better halves in life. And so if you can also, you know, at the bank we do these awards and there's always a partner award that the person who receives one can give out. I have a feeling you'd definitely be giving that to your, uh, your lovely wife. So if you can thank her as well, we really do appreciate it. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I, I, uh, as I said last night, um, you know, my, my grandfather, who I never got to meet, was very active in uh, the city of Auburn as a servant on committees back in the 1930s and the 1940s. And my dad, um, who uh, ended up taking a job at Great Northern in Millinocket and never left, 
um, served on a number of committees up in Millinock, and it was kind of, you know, like it was in my genes. And, um, and I don't think I'm the only person in town that does this. Um, but, you know, I was a failed broadcaster. <laughs> and when it came time to, you know, to moderate or host things, uh, it was a natural for me, and, and, I, and when I was asked, and it was actually uh, Nancy Kroll who asked me to step up for the chamber back in 2002, I believe it was, or 2001, it was an opportunity for me to do something that I had done when I was a younger person. And it, as you know, one thing just keeps flowing to the next. Uh, I do get a lot of satisfaction from volunteering, and I've met a lot of people in town through it, I've met all of you through the through the candidates forums. I'll be doing it again next Thursday night. Um, but I've also met a lot of people that are here in the audience, and, it, and it's and it's good for me because there's so many people that come from from different points of view. And um, you know, if I can just be part to to listen to it and and uh, and, and and really kind of learn from it. And I and I think you probably have all experienced that on being on the council. So I, I am very humbled by this award, very humbled and grateful for the words that you've expressed. Um, and uh, and uh, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and now I have to go get my daughter a ballet. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next non-action item is a report from the Scarborough Housing, Housing Alliance. Hi, Marge DeSanctis, um, Chair of Scarborough Housing Alliance. Um, I've handed out this, this letter to each counselor. So as requested, we're reporting back our plan. Um, you had asked us when we had uh, the divine capital meeting and we and all the in lieu fees were calculated that to come back in October. So uh, we've come back and we're, we're planning to engage all developers for the purpose of expanding affordable housing. So our strategy is uh, to partner with affordable housing developers and not be the provider ourselves. So we wanted to make that clear. We're not going to be a housing authority. Um, this method will leverage our money with the partners and proactively submit projects for affordable housing in Scarborough. Uh, when, when you give money to a, a developer, it can affect how, how they can process their, their applications. So we're going to apply this for both nonprofit and private developers, and it's not going to be targeted to a particular population. So it's not necessarily senior housing or, you know, whatever, so it's, it, we're just going to make it very flexible. So the plan is we're going to use the existing, uh, what is that, 7C section B5. It's the in lieu fees for affordable housing. I've kind of briefly said what they are without all the verbiage because it was much wordier <laughs> and I wanted to just keep the point here. But the fees are going to be used to establish um, affordable housing and it, it could be land acquisition, it could be infrastructure, building construction cost, whatever it is. It might be, you know, sidewalks, it might be, whatever. Uh, a portion of the funds are going to be used for, it can be used um, for administrative, legal, engineering, et cetera, design, permitting. And a portion may be used to establish a revolving loan program to provide direct financial assistance to home buy qualified home buyers. So there's a lot of different things here. The Affordable Housing Trust may also be used uh, with other town funds or other private or nonprofit funds. And the in-lieu fees contributed by the developers shall not be used by the same developer or other developers to fund construction re required to meet their density bonus. So in other words, if they have to pay in, they're getting a density bonus and they have to pay in to get that density bonus, then they can't turn around and then use those funds back for the construction. It, it kind of null and voids it. And we're hoping to include inclusionary zones uh, into this section, which it currently is not included. Um, and then we have two current projects that need funding. Avesta Southgate House, that's been an approved project and they're almost to the point of ask, uh, putting it out to bid for contractors. And there's a little glitch and, and they're going to get back to us with what their needs are when it's final, you know, when they get the contractor bids. So we're waiting on that. And then the other one is the Bessie Commons expansion. 
Um, you know, they have the land behind Bessie Commons. That's in the application stage. And again, if we were able to give some funds, a commitment of funds towards that, it would increase the point system and have a better uh, chance of passing and getting approved uh, by Main State Housing. So um, Scarborough Housing Alliance is going to prepare an open and competitive request for proposal. So we're going to include definitions in this request for proposal, pro pro RFP, I'll just call it RFP. Um, you know, it's going to say units, what, what are we talking about, what are we talking about for affordable, what is a growth area, et cetera. So those are some examples. And it is going to only be limited to the current growth areas approved in our zoning ordinance. Um, we haven't determined what the uh, award could be. It will not exceed the 20000 in lieu fee. So we know it's not going to be greater than that. It could be less than that. But we haven't, we haven't worked through all the RFP details. Um, the award is going to be time sensitive. Uh, the uh, length of the uh, res award reservation is not going to exceed 36 months. That means if, we, if you've come in with an approved project and we've given you a commitment of funds and then for some reason three years go by and you still haven't been able to do the project, you'll have to come back and start over and ask again because, um, you know, so we'll make that reservation of that award for 36 months for you to get your you know, all the little uh, things ironed out. But after 36 months, if you still haven't done the project, you know, too many things have changed, um, we ask you to come back. And it's going to have all the standard legal language that's needed, like uh, this, how the decisions are made, who makes the decision, what your discretions are. Um, we will release the RFP and align it with the affordable housing programs and when our funds are available. So the affordable housing programs run in cycles. Um, the, the QAP comes out, in fact, it's just been released, and then uh, application pre-applications are due, I think, in November, and final applications are in February. So there's a, there's a natural cycle of these things. So we would come out with our RFP to make sure that we were in that cycle, and then we'd give the developer six months to respond. So say we put it out in January, they'd have till June to come back to us with here's our proposal, here's what we need. That would give us plenty of time to look at it. We would, all the final discretion would be with the council. We would re make a recommendation. The council would make final decisions. And that would give it plenty of time before those application deadlines come for the developer. So, so we're going to try to time it with that process. Um, so we'll target recommendations. We'll give sufficient time uh, to apply to the applicant and all awards will be recommended by the, our alliance, but the discretion of the council will be the final thing. So we will prepare this for early 2018, but we will not release anything until we know how much our funds are, because at this point we have a current balance of 191,000 from prior projects, and um, we don't, that's not counting any money from ca uh, Divine Capital. So 191 now plus um, the potential of 700,000 from Divine Capital, but we don't know the timing of that. So obviously we don't want to put a, an RFP if we don't have the funds for the applicants when they come back. So we'll prepare it, we'll work through all the details, and then we just won't release it until we know more about when we'll have funds. So that's our plan. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Councilor Hayes. Just a quick question. So you know, when I look at the 36 months, is there some conversations around that? Because I know we've been talking about affordable housing. There seems to be kind of an urgency or a pent-up demand for it. <coughs> that just seems like a long cycle to have money tied up in a, mm. in a developer for 36 months. Is there, is there any magic? Can that be, is there um, things we can do to shorten this time? Well, the, the, reason, the reason for that is because say we, say we committed, like, like Avesta, okay, we, we didn't commit something to Avesta at this point. But Avesta has been almost 36 months, and they're just going to go out to the contractors for, for bid next month. Um, from when they fr first did an application. So from first application, going through that approval process with the points, getting and finding out, you know, are they in the semi-running, did they get it, that takes almost a year. And then they have to work through all the details. Then the tax credits changed, and that's when they ran into some snags, and they came back to us. And then some environmental things changed. And so... Uh, we're giving that leeway because the natural cycle from application to getting the contractor's bids to start the building, to break the ground, is at least two years. Yeah. So 
not knowing all those unknowns that could happen, we, we gave it three. But then after that, we said, that's long enough. And if, if you haven't been able to iron out these wrinkles by then, you'll have to come back and start over and ask us uh, once more for a new award. I mean, it's the best case. I, mean, I guess, you know, it's the best case. Two. Right. There probably won't be units based on this time frame for at least three years from about now. Well, the Avesta project is is it ready to works. is is ready to go, go within a few months. They're hoping to break ground within a few months. But um, we're talking also about the Bessie Commons expansion, and they're just in the application sca stage, and they're talking 40 to 46 units. Um, I, just, I just think for me, if if I know I've got 36 months, I will procrastinate to month 35. So I, I don't know if there's any way you can. Shorten that up. You put some pressure well, on to make it. And I think. It doesn't have I think when we. Program. I think when we. Our, our intent, so to speak, is that we would work with the con the developer all along the process. It's not like we just don't hear from them for 36 months and then they come in. I mean, like we've we've met with Avesta several times. Habitat stays in touch with us. I mean, so I don't. I don't think it's a a silent 36 months. I think it's a, a communicative uh, period where. We know what's going on, and uh, but yeah, we could look at language and see if there's something we should put in there that makes that clear. Kind of that we need to know the status status updates maybe every six months or something, so that you know we're not you know letting it drag on. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we can put that language in. We have, like I said, we haven't worked through the details of the RFP. We've just come up with a plan on on how we would use these funds. Any other questions? Sorry, it's not a question. It's just um, I know how much work you guys put into this, and I just wanted to make sure that I told you how much I appreciate it. I know I asked for it, and you came back right on schedule with it. I know that I think it was Tom or Sean I asked a couple weeks ago, like, okay, are we going to get that back? Mm -hmm. um, but you, well, I think there's a couple things that I would want to tweak, and I want to spend a little bit more time on it, and I would love to meet with you. Because um, I have some probably more in-depth questions than maybe everybody else needs to hear at this time, but um, I wanted to just acknowledge the fact that a lot of work went into this, and I hope that people understand that. And this is a, a complicated subject, mm -hmm. and it's not as easy as um, you know. I think a lot of people sometimes just say, "Oh, we want affordable housing." Well, why doesn't Scarborough have more affordable housing? <laughs> and we're like, we've been trying. We, it's not just throwing up homes and hoping that you know that they're okay. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's state statues and there's stuff that goes into real realty behind it and all sorts of stuff. But I wanted to make sure that I got in that I do appreciate the work that you guys did on this and the committee took the time to do this because I think this is a great first step. Thank you. And it shows um, that we're taking this seriously and that you you guys have been taking it seriously. But I think it needed to get to that extra acknowledgement level. Mm -hmm. I think it needed to get to our level so that we could help you guys push some things through a little bit faster um, and with a little bit more help. I mm -hmm. think you guys deserve that. Thank you. The comments? Council Foley. Uh, I pretty much echoing what Kate said, just thank you for the work on this. I think it's a great, I mean, nothing is ever perfect the first time mm -hmm. out and it's a great point of departure and it's nice to have, you know, uh, a plan rather than to say, okay, we, we're putting this money away but we don't know what, how we're going to use it. So I greatly appreciate that work. Thank you. Other comments? Um, I just want to add, if you don't um, this is um, a great step forward for us, um, so I really appreciate the work that has been done. So, um, but I do want to share that I hope that we are also, um, that we move forward with a little bit of caution, only in the sense that I see within this um, some gaps, only in the sense that I want to make sure that whenever you deal with money, you're going to need to deal with um, anti-discrimination, discriminative issues about how selection is made. And so you really need to have a procedural document and a policy that backs that up to fill in that gap so that you don't have someone coming in afterwards that says, well, it doesn't tell me what the selection process really undertook. How did you make a decision to fund me but not fund, or fund them but not fund me? But I think that there just needs to be kind of a supporting piece of this mm -hmm. um, because in essence, um, you create, uh, you're not really creating a housing authority. I mean, I, um, what did you call it before? Um, like an official housing authority? I mean, it is. Yeah, well, it's just that you're not going to get paid for what you do for all this work. <laughs> well, no, I mean, a housing authority actually 
is more involved in the actual house. Developers. We're working with the developers. Who owns and managers. Yeah, yeah, owns and managers. We're just working with the developers. Yeah. But that's where this, um, where the standard legal language, we're going to put in how the decisions are made, okay. what the discretion is, um, you know, whatever. Uh, we, we are going to put in a limit per unit, and we talked about that, and we said, well, it can't exceed the 20000 that they pay per unit. But then if we put in 20000 everyone will put in that they want 20000 per unit. So, um, you know, we have to, we, we might do it by volume, like, you know, if, if you only have five units, you can get this much per unit. I mean, we haven't gone through all those details of what the RFP would look like. We just decided this is how we're going to approach it. Yep. And for the currently, we only have the 191, and currently we're just going to look at the two projects that are before us right now. So I just want to make one recommendation because I see it cause being an underwriter for a commercial bank. Okay. Um, is taking into consideration that the award not to exceed should also maybe be measured as a percentage of the project, mm -hmm. and not just on a dollar basis. You can use the dollar basis as the maximum threshold. Uh, but also on a percentage basis, I see that very frequently. Okay. Um, so I'd love to sit down and have a cup of coffee and go over some things that I see on a, you know, from a, okay. from a commercial underwriting of things that get presented. So. Any other comments? I just, uh, I want to reiterate, uh, final decisions are at rest with this council or future councils, so it would make perfect sense for us once we have an RFP to perhaps pass that document by you as a draft oh, to get the uh, feedback, because yeah. we want to make sure we start off correctly so the final product is something that's acceptable. And I, I just had two comments. I just wanted to make clear that, that the thought was that we would put out, probably do this over a number of years, given the amount of money and the, the nature with which it's going to come in. So the, the thought was not to just have one RFP, but to do right. one RFP in 2018, probably Multiple. following up following up later. And then the other one was um, there really was a, a, a thoughtful discussion around targeting toward populations such as seniors or, or uh, individuals with disability. Um, and really the decision was that, um, that, or the guidance that we received or, uh, during the discussion was really that the, the QAP, when it comes out, will target um, populations that, as it, as it, depending on the decisions of the main housing authority, uh, Sorry, main housing authority. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, uh, and uh, and that we we just want to keep this as flexible as possible, and that's why we decided not not to to try and put in particular targets. So, if for discrimination purposes, yeah. like you said, we were going to make it very flexible. We're going to go to any and all developers and whatever population. I mean, so it it wasn't going to be, you know, we're looking for senior housing only from nonprofits or you know whatever. We're not going to do that. So, um, you know, that was going to make it. So then we could look at the value. To Scarborough and how many units and how much money and you know all those factors. So that's what we have to work on for the RFP is what are those criteria? And so we haven't done that part yet. We've we've had brief discussions about kinds of things that should be in it, but we haven't we haven't actually sat down and done that. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I say thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on to um, public hearings, order number 17-095 is the public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 901, the Town of Scarborough Garbage and Recycling Collection and Disposal Ordinance, Article 1, Section 1.09 and 1.10, as recommended by the Ordinance Committee. If I could ask the Chairman of the Committee to give an overview before the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an ordinance to prohibit uh, defacing of trash carts. Uh, it arose from a complaint that uh, carts were being used as uh, a signboard. Uh, so a few concerns have been expressed uh, by people. Uh, uh, not good use of our time. This is not a big deal. Uh, people often put uh, a sticker on to identify their carts, uh, and we've tried to provide responses to these to people who have raised these concerns that uh, these are, are good questions to raise and legitimate questions, and we need to be responsive to them. Uh, uh, I think the uh, conclusion certainly of the uh, ordinance committee was that people uh, who have been putting small stickers on for years for identification purposes uh, uh, should not be concerned that there will be any enforcement uh, ag against them. Uh, we are encouraging people who have uh, uh, a sticker for identification purposes uh, to write their address uh, uh, on it. That's uh, specifically allowed in the ordinance to, to actually write your address. Uh, and people put their street number, some people put their entire address. 
uh, the, uh, uh, there certainly have been some uh, concern that uh, uh, this is not a uh, something that the town should pursue to very small potatoes, but uh, uh, I did a quick internet search. In less than five minutes, I found towns all over the country who have identical provisions, Ohio, uh, Utah, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, Nashua, New Hampshire has one, uh, Londonderry, New Hampshire has one. So uh, I came to the conclusion that it, it was probably an oversight on the part of the people who drafted this in the first instance. Uh, it's, it looks like it's a pretty common uh, 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 provision. Our, our goal here really is to protect the public uh, property that's involved, avoid barrels being littered with stickers uh, that would make them a problem for the next person who uh, owns the house so that uh, the barrels do go with the house uh, uh, and uh, avoid having uh, uh, people use public property as a message board uh, is probably the other uh, important factor. So there you go. Thank you. Uh, I would like to now open it up to public hearing. If there's anyone that would like to get up and speak, you have three minutes at the podium, and if you can give your name and address, that would be wonderful. Benjamin Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, I often come up and speak on what I determine as, you know, issues of free speech. This here is not so much uh, free speech because these trash cans are owned by the property. But um, two of the comments tonight in the public comment section regarding signs uh, concern me with this issue. <laughs> Again, it's about policing and enforcing this. Um, right now, you have citizens calling you because you changed the ordinance and are going around and self-policing the area and calling because uh, they disagree with the ordinance or they just you know, feel that the justice is, oh, I need to call in on every sign. Doing this again, I feel, is a similar situation where for us to police it. I think that maybe uh, an easier process would just be charge the residents when they sell the home to replace the trash cans. Um, from driving around town, I don't see that many trash cans. I get it that there are other towns in this country with provisions, but there are probably just as many towns in this country without those same provisions. Um, so again, I just caution doing these small changes um, because the tax on the town, the burden on the town to police and control them is maybe small but do add up when it comes to counting dollars. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katie Fellows, 12 Snowberry Drive. Uh, I support the proposed ordinance change prohibiting most marking of town waste and recycling carts. I don't, I don't understand why the tax payment that I'm making this month right here supports you know, political signage or commercial signage that's in violation of the town ordinance. So why are taxpayers subsidizing commercials or commercial ads on public property? If we don't allow such signage on our fire trucks or on school property, um, I'm not sure why this scenario is okay. Um, I know that political signage has been a hot topic in town this year, clearly, uh, and this council agreed to tighten restrictions on such signage after this most recent election season. I'd argue that those rules are similarly challenging to enforce. Enforcement is a challenge. Um, but I think that it's worth the effort when violations are truly egregious. Um, I envision a trash cart ordinance that's similar to the yard sale permitting ordinance. Uh, it just gives the town a tool to target you know, particularly problematic defacings. Um, to me, political and commercial ads on these carts are, are the definition of problematic. Um, they just fly in the face of the public interest in this public asset. And the council, I think, agreed this year when they endorsed increasingly strict regulation of campaign signs in public ways. Uh, thank you all for your thoughtful consideration of this matter. Thank you. <coughs> Susan Hamill, uh, 3 Bay Street. Um, 
I'm sorry to see this still moving forward. Um, I, I know about two weeks ago, there was an article in the local paper about a woman in Rockland who had a sign in her yard, a pro-Trump sign, and um, she said she'd rather go to jail than be forced to take that sign down. And um, that, that actually went viral. I mean, that became national news. And uh, there was, it was in The Guardian. It was in the UK. I mean, it was, it was a big news story. So I hope that Scarborough doesn't become known as the town that um, forces someone to take, take their sign down and becomes a big news story. Um, it, but I do see the creation of this ordinance as important because it's symptomatic of a town government just overstepping its proper role and taking steps to solve a problem which isn't there. It's a slow creep of government into aspects of everyday life where it just doesn't belong. This is town property, I understand that, but unlike most other town property, I've got to keep it in my yard or in my driveway or somewhere on my property. So. It shouldn't be treated the same as a fire truck or a police car. I, I use this thing every day. My bin and most of the bins are, are either dark brown or almost black. You know, the body of the bin is very dark. I, I can barely see the top of my bin. So for me to write a little um, three bay street somewhere that I'm going to be able to see it easily without, you know, trying to, the top of the yellow bin, yeah, I guess I could see that, but not, not on the one with the green lid. So putting stickers just makes a lot of sense um, to be able to identify your trash bin. And if you're, you happen to have, have a Trump bumper sticker, right, that's all you have right there, well, put it on. But I guess, and I did watch the Ordinance Committee um, meeting this past week, and the chairman uh, of the committee said that, well, you could just take a marker and mark over the sticker with your address, and that would, that would be okay. So if I just put a whole bunch of stickers on my bin and I put three Bay Street on each one of them, is that okay? Um, anyway, I'm not trying to make this difficult, but I, I just, I don't agree with it. Uh, I think this property is different than most other town property. And uh, I just, you know, we, we paid money to put an ad in the paper for the public notice. So we are spending money and, you know, town money and resources already on this. Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. Poop and trash, what a night. Um, the stickers on the trash barrels, I, I, again, I feel it, 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 it came about with a political sticker that someone didn't agree with, obviously. Um, the, the sign ordinance, you know, that, that's, as we know now, is the new ordinance is not applying just to political signs, it's applying to all signs now, content neutral. The stickers, I can see it being a problem if, if someone plasters stickers all over their trash bin, all over. If someone puts a sugar loaf sticker on their trash bin, big deal. You know, one or two stickers to find, you know. I think that uh, Mr. Longstaff and Toady and others have a lot more to do than to police trash bins if they have more than three stickers on them. And, uh, if there is a trash bin that is covered all over with stickers and the property sells, let the buyer complain. And then the seller has to replace the trash bin. You know, to be driving around town looking at who's got more than three stickers on the bin, I, I, I just think you all have better things to do with your time. Any other comments? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. I'm sorry, the public hearing. and. Um, this will go to, I'm sorry, what's the date of the? October 20th. October 20th will be the date of the second reading. Moving on to order number 17-100.
It's a 7 p it's not 7 p.m. It's a public hearing and action on the request for a food handler's license from Flaherty's Family Farm, Inc., doing business as Flaherty, Flaherty's Family Farm, located at 123 Payne Road and Willowdale Golf Club, located at 52 Willowdale Road. Is there any comments from the public regarding the license? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Is there an action from the council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from council for the clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to old business, order number 17-075 is a second reading on the proposed amendments to the second contract zoning agreement between the town of Scarborough and Bob Jettis and Lucinda Malbon as uh, presented by the planning department. Would the manager like to give an overview before any public comment? Uh, fairly simple amendment to the contract zone. I see Karen Martin uh, on behalf of SEDCO here who initiated that uh, and Mr. Uh, Jettis is here as well. Um, if the council wishes to know more of the detail, I would certainly suggest you invite one or both of them up to the podium. If no one's jumping out of their seat needing that, I'm going to ask is there any public comment? Not seeing any, we close the public comment. Is there an action from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Moving on to order number 17-087. It is a second reading on the proposed amendment to the Town of Scarborough's official zoning map to rezone the parcel located in the Enterprise Business Park identified as map U39, lot 4701, as shown on the Town Assessor's map from the General Business District B3 to the Haggis, sorry, uh, Haggis. Haggis. Are you reading the, the right order? We had this confusion last time about what. Oh, I'm, I, pro I apologize. I went beyond one. Yep. Thank you for the correction. This should be actually order number 17-086, a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance, Section 6, Definitions, and Section <coughs> 17B, Haggis. Highgus Parkway District, as represented by SEDCO. Is there an overview from the manager? I would like to defer to uh, Karen Martin, if, if possible. Would you permit that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good evening, Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. So what you have before you is a series of amendments that really addresses an opportunity that the um, owner of the Enterprise Business Park brought forward. They have been working with um, a company called Bluebird Storage and they came to us and said we would really like to have uh, Bluebird Storage be considered um, for a lot within the Enterprise Business Park. When we looked at this, both from the planning perspective and from the economic development perspective, we realized there are a, a, a multi-step process here. There are several things that we needed to consider. Um, the first piece that we wanted to consider was we needed to um, add a use to the zone, to Haigas Parkway, if this was going to be permitted in, um, in the Enterprise Business Park. One of the things we did is we looked at the difference between um, the, an older style of mini storage, which is essentially a mini self-storage, if you will, um, which is something that's been around for a while. It's characterized by uh, multiple entries into the business, um, garage doors everywhere, and really um, um, less expensive materials. It's really what we put in the industrial park. It's perfectly suited for that. Well, what we saw when we talked with the Bluebird Storage folks and with the Enterprise Business Park is what they were bringing forward was, was a different animal, if you will. Still storage, still multiple access uh, points um, for people to store their, their materials and their goods. However, this type of storage has internal access. So all of the units that were going to be developed would have internal access. There would be limited external access uh, points. So everybody would be entering in one point and coming off of a, a central corridor. These facilities also had uh, climate control um, and they were a higher end version of really what we've seen um, in terms of um, the old version of mini storage. We also took a look at some industry standards and saw that the industry is really moving in a different direction. 
They really wanted, um, from an industry perspective, they wanted to be in areas that were closer to um, business and residential. They felt they were more suited to business parks, if you will, um, which is definitely what the situation where we were talking about with the Enterprise Business Park. So when we looked at this, we felt like there could be a distinction between um, this older style of mini storage and this new version of mini storage. And the difference really is um, getting back to how it looks and how it impacts the property. So with this new definition, we came up with um, it does need to be uh, have the internal access points, so you don't have multiple garages facing out. Um, it does need to be climate controlled. Um, and it does, if we wanted to allow it in another zone other than the industrial, it does need to have um, a presence. The materials have to be of a nature that would be compatible with the standards that are in the uh, Hygis Parkway or with the Enterprise Business Park. So we felt like there could be this separate carved off definition. And so that is one step of the amendments that you have, is recognizing that there are two different types of storage facilities. So the second piece of this is really looking at, again, sort of jump the gun, where this new type of facility might be appropriate. And we looked at all the different types of zones, and we felt like Hygis Parkway made the most sense, uh, partly because of its um, central nature. Um, it is intended to be a business zone. It was intended to have um, perhaps a more intensive use, and that's one of the things that when we looked at the industry standards, um, these types of facilities do tend to be large. And in fact, the one that uh, the Enterprise Business Park is looking at is somewhere between 75,000 and 100,000 square feet. So that's a large facility. We didn't feel that really made a lot of sense in some of the more retail zones, but felt like Hygis Parkway, um, we, we really could accommodate something like that. So this brings us to the last step in this, which is the lot that they were interested in with respect to um, the Enterprise Business Park. There is one lot that actually was zoned B3. Um, the rest of the Enterprise Business Park is zoned for Hygis Parkway. And we understand why this original lot, or the, this first lot into the parkway, or into the Enterprise Business Park, was zoned B3. It was making it compatible with the rest of Route 1. But when you look at the map, and I think we've provided that in your packet, when you look at the map, this lot um, that is the first lot as you enter into the business park really fronts on the internal access road. It does not front on to, to Route 1. And only the side, the, the majority of the frontage of this um, lot is fronting on the um, internal access road. So we felt like that lot really could be and probably should be um, part of Hygis Parkway zoning. It would be consistent with the rest of the um, business park and you know it would allow for um, the Bluebird storage to work with the Enterprise Business Park um, on that particular lot. So again, it's a multi-step process, um, one that includes um, some things that we felt like the zoning ordinance needed to do really to modernize and be part of this new version of what the industry is presenting. The other part of it is certainly working with Enterprise Business Park to accommodate um, a proposal that's coming through. Um, so again, three-step process there, um, really talking about um, adding a new definition. Um, we did keep this new use, we made them um, stick to the original performance standards of the mini storage. So there were some questions about access and what could be stored there. We follow all of these same, we subject um, the uh, new version to all the standards that were originally there, with the exception of um, two things. Um, one, obviously, we're allowing it to go in the Hygis Parkway, and two, um, we did say if it's going to be in the Hygis Parkway, we didn't see any reason to restrict the impervious cover um, regulation, which is part of the mini storage piece. 
we felt like if we were going to allow it in Highgus Parkway, it should be subject to all the, the standards that are in the Highgus Parkway. And one of the aspects, one of the reasons we really liked Highgus Parkway for this is because it's very specific about the design standards. So we felt like this definition combined with Highgus Parkway standards create a very uh, different type of unit and we cr it creates something that can be very compatible um, with a business park atmosphere and perhaps other places on the Highgus Parkway. I'm going to stop there because I've been talking a long time and Tom's nodding his head like you've gone on too long. <laughs> but, um, so. um, any technical questions from Council before I open it up to public comments? I don't know if this is technical or not. Was that the only lot available for Bluebird in the in Enterprise Business Park? I think that was one of the larger lots. So given the size that they wanted to build, that's where it fit. I do have... Jason here from the um, uh, representing the owner tonight, uh, but I believe that that was one of the reasons why they wanted that. And I'm not. I, I I think they did like the fact that it was the first lot into the parkway, uh, or into the enterprise business. Park. So I guess I would reverse it so that it wasn't a matter that there was not another lot. It was a preferred lot because of location, because mm -hmm. it was the first lot. Right. Uh, but but I not the only lot that would work. I might defer that to Jason. <laughs> Good evening, members of the council. Jason Vafiatis, Atlantic Resource Consultants. I think predominantly it's the one of the largest lots there, the size of the building they want, and also the other lots have some sort of wetland setbacks and other things that sort of affect the size of the buildings. To the shape of this building, that really is the only lot that they, that's available right now that they could use. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. With that, I'd like to open it. Is there any public comment? Not so many. Is there an action from council? So moved. Second. Second. Um, so just a couple of pieces, just for the public uh, to understand. Council Chiesa was not able to attend this evening because he is away <coughs> on business, but he did send us as individual counselors an email that um, expressed some questions and concerns regarding the proposal, but he was comfortable and sharing that he uh, wants that to move forward. Um, I don't, I'm not going to read it into the record. It will be submitted into the record, but I'd like to ask the manager maybe to submit it to uh, Ms. Martin so that he could receive his uh, questions and response. I do know that he's also spoken with um, a member of the planning board, and they tend to bring up many of these questions because there is their review process as well on it. Right. So I just wanted uh, people to know that it is being at least submitted for the record. So uh, with that, is there any questions or uh, comments from council regarding the request. Council Rowan? Yeah, um, so just, just to be clear though, the, the, the issue on the table is the, the adding the allowed use into the Haggis Parkway zone. Correct. Okay. Um, the oh, sorry, it, there are two, two items. One, we have to create the definition and then add it. So are, are we taking them both at the same time or are we, are we doing one okay. and then the other? Oh, we are. Or will they follow each other? Yeah, they're, they follow each other. 86 and 87. 87. Yep. So we're doing them separately. Yes, they're separate. Correct? 86 is the definition. There's, there's, there's two components to... Uh, well, the first one is definitions. I mean, that's what it says right in the motion. So yeah. it's going to be the definition, and the second one has to be the second part. Right. Well, two things. The, the text changes are in the first, and then the next is the map change. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the definition and the addition to Highgate Parkway is in the first. Okay. First order. So just to be clear, order number 86 actually has two pieces associated with the same motion. It creates the definition, and it moves it into the uh, HP zone. Correct. I, we certain that's the that's the case that we're, we're changing this parcel from one zone to the other as part of 86. So what's 87? 87 is the actual yeah. zone map change. That's the, that's the physical change. That's where we got mixed up last time, too. I jumped. Right. So, so the two text <laughs> changes, uh, you know, are definition and add Highgus Parkway. And the next is move 
it's a map change. The, the lot goes from B3 to HP. Right. So, the, so this parcel, the, the change of this particular parcel from B3 to Haggis Parkway Zone is not what's on the table currently. Correct? What's on the table currently is allowing mini, mini storage inside of Haggis Parkway. Correct. Okay. So my comment is in reference to that. Um, so we just had, um, uh, we just went through Planet Palooza last week. We had a lot of discussion about this particular part of town as being a, um, uh, uh, a potential opportunity for a vibrant town center. Mm -hmm. And I, I stick to my comments at first reading, which is that we would have a missed opportunity if we were to fill the Haggis Parkway zone with um, storage units, and I just don't feel like um, that's something that we want, and I'm not going to be able to support this measure. Councilor Foley? Um, so just coming off of Planet Palooza and talking with a lot of citizens about the Route 1 corridor and one of the resounding themes again was, oh, well, Route 1 is Route 1, you can't change Route 1. And um, I don't necessarily believe that. I think there is a lot we could do there, and I want to be mindful and thoughtful of that. Uh, and so for many of those similar uh, reasons, I would be I'm hesitant to support this at all at this point. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, and I guess I would <coughs> I would kind of echo that, that the redefine it to allow, you know, if it, if it, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it is a duck. Um, so to change the definition to allow self-storage, I just I kind of echo that as a prime piece of property. It's the largest piece of property we just heard. From a value point of view, the, the assessed value of it will be about half of what a commercial or professional building would be in that in that space. Plus, it's kind of the gateway into that parkway. So I'm just, and then, and then if you look at the third piece of that too, it's so there's assessed value, but it also, you know, won't create much employment in that area. It may be a single or a couple people may be working in the building. It also will not create employment for many people, and it will not create business in the greater community. So I just think, I kind of echo, there was a lot of excitement about what we could do to kind of change <coughs> the community feel, so I, I won't be able to support the, the language change. Other comments? Um, I am in favor of this. Um, the fact is that we have been trying to develop the entire um, Haggis Parkway for over 20 years. The fact that we're finally receiving interest, no matter what its form, so long as it's not residential in its uh, majority nature, even though there has been a component, is a positive move uh, for not only the landowners but also for the community as a whole. And there's a balance to the decisions that we make and the balance is that while you can give in one particular project or area, you make up for that in the other parts and that can be identified through the Planet Palooza, the planning process. Um, <coughs> this is not unreasonable. Um, given its um, proximity to Route 1, the aesthetics that it's going to be uh, required to perform to. Um, this is not a, um, a surprise, um, given um, the development that has already gone on even you know, within that area and the changes that are happening to the <coughs> landscape. And when I say landscape, I'm also talking about the building designs, you know, because um, the Jaguar <coughs> dealership is right next door. That's changing as we speak and meeting to uh, more conforming standards. So I don't see a problem with this. The question I have is um, whether or not there is an interest, because uh, based on comments, um, um, I would like to at least ask, is there a, a preference to table this until a further um, time, or is there a preference to simply vote on it tonight? Yes. It, I, w I just want to clarify, because I'm not sure I'm clear. So I, my, my understanding was that if we change the definition, it could be allowed in HP2. So that I would be okay with that, um, but that lot is not HP2. That's the, the that's really where my kind of uh, bone of contention is, is really that, that specific lot, yeah. not so much that I don't think this type of storage could work really well in, in the Hayes Parkway. So am I, con am I doing it backwards? <coughs> no. Hi. Hi, uh, <laughs> guess. Yes, I know. Did I? Sorry, I just, I, the correction just threw me off in thinking, Mr. Donovan. Uh, I can support this because uh, uh, while I respect the Planapalooza reference, the aesthetics are there and the controls. 
you can't always control the extent to which jobs are created or so, but the aesthetics are, are there. And it's really, uh, it, it's off of Route 1 if you look at, it's not a Route 1 issue, it's a uh, the business park issue. And so I, I, can, I could support this as being appropriate. Councilor Rowan? So I, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware. Mm -hmm. so, so what we're currently voting on is allowing in the Haggis Parkway zone um, mini storage uh, anywhere in the Haggis Parkway zone. It's not restricted to this lot. We're changing what's allowed in the Haggis Parkway zone to in include this use. Yes. And I'm, I'm but, 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 clar but, but clarity, if, if, if we change the definition to allow this use and then we go on in to rezone it, then it could be allowed on that lot, right? Yeah, so it's that's, a really that's complex. Effect. It's a really complex. If we just heard, that's the only place they want to go is that lot. So I don't know how you separate the two conversations. So maybe we change the motion. I, I do agree. I think there may be a place for these new types of self storage somewhere where it's in there, but I have a problem with the parcel. So I don't know how we answer that question. But I, they're, they are they are intertwined. So what I would like to recommend for consideration is that we table this issue, no, refer what? it back to staff to answer those questions given what has come out of. you think that we can answer all of those questions this evening? Okay. I think it's pretty clear what we're yeah. putting on. I don't have any questions. I don't see why we would table it. I'm confused. So there's questions what? in which the council brought up. I, I'm, I'm clarified now. I, basically, it's as Councillor Hayes said, it's that lot that I have the issue with. If we so I could support changing the definition piece, and there are places within the Haggis Parkway zone that I could absolutely support uh, this kind of self-storage, but I would not be in support of changing lot number. I can't see that <laughs> lot number. Uh, but that first lot on Route 1, because, again, my, you know, I, I get that it's uh, facing the... Um, Enterprise Road there, whatever that name of the road is, but it's still for me, it's on Route 1 and it would be seen. And I feel like that's that's the part. I'm stuck on the lot, not so much the zone, if that clarifies for people where I, how I stand. So the alternative to tabling is to divide the question so that you can decide on the definition first and then on the second piece then they can um, and then the allowable <laughs> piece to that? So I think the question's already divided. We have two separate issues. The first yeah. one is... But it's in one well, motion. It's in one motion. You'd have to divide it up. You have to divide the two issues out. If you support the definition but not the location of the no, request, the, you have the to divide second, it up. The second issue is changing the lot from right. B3 right. to Haggis Parkway Zone. The first question is what do we allow in the Haggis Parkway Zone? Right. Oh, it is, okay. It's certainly right. possible for these to be, uh, they're considered separately and they could stand independently. It Great. I'm critical to this development. If I'm hearing uh, several comments, there they, uh, there is substantial support for allowing it in the Haggis Parkway zone, which is the motion that's presently in before us, but not for the lot that's the B3 zone oh. property. So if I could, I don't think we're debating the second issue currently. I, um, so I don't know that we can judge support for that yet. I certainly have an opinion that I'm happy well, to offer, but... It's not what's in front of us. But but isn't that what everyone's commented on? I said that. I I did, but yes. Yes. Yeah. But and you and you interpreted it very well for me. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think that. <laughs> but I see it as uh, as separate. So that's why I could vote for 17-086 and then not the parcel change. 87. Right. And that way they could choose a different lot and maybe they might have to make three or four less units right. I don't know but they could still do what they want to do exactly. somewhere in that zone there are other opportunities in the, that zone and for the town maybe there's a better spot maybe not for them but for the town yeah, and I apologize when I heard that I can support one and not the other I was thinking of the definition versus the identification within the zone so that's oh, my, sorry. my apologies no. for getting that confused so with that um, based on what I'm hearing it sounds like unless there's more comments or questions we can move the question um, is there any other comments or questions before I do that? Peter? No, I'm just confused about what you're going to move now. <laughs> the, the main motion. What's in front of you? What's in front of you? The main motion. It's order number 17-086.
It's a move of approval of the second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance, Section 6, Definitions, and Section 17B. And it's what is included in the document under Definitions, and then also under... So it'll be an allowed use. Yes. So that's it. That's nothing it. about the lot. Exactly. Nothing about the lot. Yep. Right, it creates the definition, yeah. it doesn't exist today, and it allows it generally anywhere in the HP zone as it currently exists. Is that clear? Councilor Hayes, is that clear now? Okay. Is there any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, and all opposed? One, two. I'm sorry, did I miss one? No. I think there's two opposed? Five, no, one. Just one. No, I think it was five. No, a bigger point. Yep. Sorry. Um, the next item, I just want to forget the right one. I know I get myself confused here. It is order number 17 087. It's move approval of the second reading on the proposed amendment for the Town of Scarborough's official zoning map to rezone the parcel located in the Enterprise Business Park identified as map U39, lot 4701, as shown on the Town Assessor's map from the General Business District B3 to the Higus. Parkway District HP, as presented by SEDCO. Any other comments? Uh, I almost called you counselor. <laughs> <laughs> and Director Martin. Uh, no, I think, you know, it's, um, again, this is a, a, a uh, owner-initiated initiated change. Um, so Mr. Miley, who owns the Enterprise Business Park, um, is before you asking for this, this particular change. And he did look at um, the lots and really felt like this was a, a great lot for him. And I don't know whether Jason wants to add anything else from uh, Mr. Miley's standpoint. Uh, yes, I would just add that, you know, looking at the different sort of ec environmental impacts and things on the other lots that are building, to successfully build these facilities, they need a certain square footage and that, you know, and, they, they have done some searches within Haggis Parkway, and I have a number of clients that own property on Haggis Parkway, and we're doing concept plans for them, you know, on almost seems like a daily basis. And getting a contiguous amount of uplands is, is very hard in that area. So, you know, comments like it would be great for like a town center type of thing, and that's just environmentally, you know, probably not going to happen through the planning board process. So just add that, that this lot, you think there's a lot of land out there, but it is one lot that is particularly well suited to this site from a land use perspective. So, thank you. Thank you. Any public comment? Not seeing any, is there an action from the council? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Comments and questions? Council Rowan. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, one point of clarity in the, uh, so there was some confusion on September 6th as well in the last discussion, if you can believe it, we were, had similar con uh, confusion. Um, and I, I actually voted to um, support that on September 6th. The council practice said that I did not. Um, and similarly, I, I don't really have a problem with switching um, this particular lot from a B3 zone into a the Haggis Parkway zone. Um, and I'm uh, gonna support this. I'm sorry, you're going to support I am going to support Oh, thank you. Just for clarification, that is. <laughs> Council Foley. Um, and so when I look at the map, uh, for me, what I see is, uh, you know, that whole Route 1 corridor was zoned differently. Uh, and so I asked myself, well, why? There, there had to be a reason the plan, you know, I know our planning board goes through a uh, long process to, to be thoughtful and mindful about that. And going back to the plan of Palooza piece and, and the vision for long term for that Route 1 corridor, um, I just feel like there could, I, I just don't want it on Route 1. And I like the idea of those self-storage units. I've seen them. Some of them are very, very nice, and I know there's a need. Um, I just don't think the first lot on, on Route 1, so I'm not going to support that change. Sorry, there's no public comment at this time. Nope. Any other comments? Yes. Well, I, now I'm confused, too, because I think we just approved that the, the self-storage units as redefined are allowed in Hargis, Hargis Parkway. And now if we, if we, we rezone this, B, this from B3 to Hagas Parkway, that's where the self-storage unit's going to go. So I, based on that, I, I agree with Councillor Foley. I don't support the, the change. Councillor, I think. No, I, and, and I commented earlier that uh, I think the aesthetic controls make this suitable 
uh, uh, particularly given that it is not essentially fronting on uh, Route 1. Yeah, and I, I just want to clarify that, that uh, my concern with the other one is I don't like the use of uh, the mini storage in the Highest Parkway zone. Um, I don't have a problem with having this lot, given that it's contiguous to the Highest Parkway zone. It's really, you know, when you look at it, it's part of the Enterprise Business Park, which is in the Highest Parkway zone. I don't really have a concern. And, and as uh, Mr. Chase um, said last time when he presented, you know, it's really separated from Route 1 by that jug handle. Um, I certainly don't don't have a problem with switching this particular lot. Councilor Foley? My only other concern, uh, and just something for people to think about and consider, is that so if I'm now B3 anywhere and up and down where it's red there instead of the yellow, uh, and I just watched the council switch uh, this one lot to the highest parkway zone because it allows a different kind of use, now as, a, as an owner, am I going to now approach the town and are we setting a precedence for that whole corridor to then come to us and ask for that kind of a change. And again, I would point to, you know, the comprehensive planning process and really what the long-term vision is. And until that's articulated, um, I mean, I know what was articulated in the past, but that could, hope, you know, shift a little bit given, you know, what we're thinking about. So that, that's why primarily and why I'm not going to support it. But I understand what everyone said. and. I appreciate the conversation. <laughs> yeah, and, and my only comment to that is the difference between this lot and the rest of uh, the lots fronting Route 1 that are contiguous is that really the access to this lot is, is only through the park. So you have to go into the park to get into this, this parcel. Um, so I kind of see it as, as separate from, you know, the, the, the other businesses along that corridor that have direct access. Um, the only uh, comment that I wanted to, a uh, couple of first is I, I really want to apologize for uh, confusing the process if I did. I was, you know, you try to think about the conversation and think about the topic and then also think about how it has to process so that not only we understand but then the people who are watching. So that is my fault and I apologize because um, I was literally listening to, to um, the individual words um, so I can keep that track. You know, I made a... Um, I mean, I share the same comment that Councillor Foley made as far as what precedent does this set for other landowners in the area or elsewhere when you sit there and make an exception or you do something like this for one. However, I think that the process that's undertaken, and there is one parcel in the same area that, um, you know, went through this thoughtful process. In fact, it's right across, the, as you're coming out of Enterprise Park, if you go straight ahead um, onto Willowdale, it's either the second or third parcel that had been originally residential, maybe R4, um, and it was rezoned to B3, or I can't remember exactly, the, uh, but it was rezoned for a different use. Um, and it goes through, I think it goes through, when those decisions are recommended, it goes through a very strong vetting process, not only through SEDCO, but um, the planning department. Um, but if I remember correctly, this was unanimously supported by the planning board. And so I do take their um, recommendation um, very well because um, they are the experts, and I, I do um, look to them. So I'm extremely comfortable in, in you know, supporting this. I think it's a uh, smart move uh, for development. So uh, with that, if there's no other comments or questions, I'm going to call the question. All in favor of the motion? One, two. All opposed? Four. Sorry, I had to think that through for a second. Three, three, or it was two, four. It was two, four. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to, make sure I get the right order. Uh, new business, order number 17-101, act on the request to amend the special amusement application as recommended by the Ordinance Committee for an executive summary from the Ordinance Chair. May I see this? Oh, yeah. Uh, Which one is it? Uh, special amusement. Oh, special amusement. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, this arose as a result of some concerns expressed by some no uh, uh, Pine Point residents uh, over <coughs> noise. Uh, <coughs> came to the uh, uh, ordinance committee, and our effort was really to uh, modify the amusement uh, permit application process <coughs> so that. Uh, uh, it was more responsive to this kind of concern. We were advised that our town attorney considered the um, good neighbor ordinance uh, uh, f uh, relative to noise abatement uh, applicable <coughs> and would supersede the amusement permit itself. 
something that I don't think any of us really realized before. So that was a new situation. <clears throat> uh, so our goal was uh, to uh, develop a, a formal process for issuing permits uh, uh, with conditions. Uh, uh, part of that involved uh, uh, disclosures on the uh, on the application form itself. Uh, uh, part of that involved notification to abutters so that we'd have a more open and transparent process. Uh, and the changes were unanimously endorsed by the Ordinance Committee. <coughs> uh, and our end goal was to be able to present to the Town Council uh, recommendations uh, for conditions whenever the noise ordinance, the good neighbor noise ordinance, was not going to be applicable so that uh, 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 we could try and deal with these outdoor uh, events that uh, potentially were disruptive of neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, with that, is there any public comment? Not seeing any. Uh, is there action by council? So moved. Second. Okay. Comments or questions? Councilor Foley? Um, I think it's a good addition to the application process. One of the other things I would like to see us, uh, and I'm thankful to the Ordinance Committee for taking it up readily and moving on it right away, um, but I'd also like to make it sure that now we're kind of heading into the quiet dead zone season, so I don't expect that we'll have you know, too many concerns, but it would be a good idea to be proactive and reach out to those businesses that we know have potentially affected and make sure that they're aware um, that there is growing concern there and um, let's try to figure out how to head it off and not have some bigger problems than we need. Other comments? Council Rowan. I think one of the other uh, benefits, and I apologize if um, Bill covered this, but um, was that we just wanted to clarify that the uh, the good neighbor ordinance um, does apply re regardless of whether or not you have a special amusement permit, unless you know we, you've been given special waivers. Uh, and so um, that's really what we're doing here is is um, just pointing that out and and providing an opportunity for them to request that. Other comments or questions? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, the next item is order number 17-102. It's a move approval of the request to appoint Larissa Crockett, assistant town manager, as a full voting member to the Maine Municipal Association's Legislative Policy Committee, as recommended by the council chair. Um, in an um, executive overview, the town of Scarborough is given one seat on the Legislative Policy Committee uh, to represent the entire district, which includes Gorham and Buxton. Um, that position is really a, um, again, it's just by its title, it's legislative advocacy in which you go to Augusta, you participate in a forum, and um, you uh, then promote the uh, issues of the Maine Municipal Association in your community. I cannot serve in that capacity, and Larissa is the um, current alternate delegate, and so I'd like to ask that uh, you approve that uh, appointment. Um, is there any public comment? Not seeing any. Any questions? Uh, is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. And uh, comments or questions? Councilor Donovan? I certainly like the fact that uh, Larissa is prepared to do, fill this role. Uh, she's a very capable person. I do like, however, having a uh, town council member uh, uh, be in that role as well so that while we're initiating this action today, I would favor uh, if one of us uh, or a new councilor came along uh, I'd certainly support uh, uh, having that person serve in this capacity and Larissa acting as the backup. Councilor? I agree with fully support everything that Councilor Donovan just said. I would have said the exact same thing. Thank you. Um, the, the only other item is that I would recommend that if there is going to be a f uh, future change, that, right now there, is, there isn't any urgency in this because it's a down. I mean, the legislature is not really um, working. They're coming back for, um, I think, a special session. Um, I, I agree with you about her qualifications. She actually has already served in this capacity for her home community when she was a select woman um, in the town of Acton. So I think she's well suited for that, um, including given her new profession. Um, by the way, uh, the only difference between the delegate and the alternate is um, who cast the official vote on behalf of the town. So both are contributors to the conversation and attend 
uh, the meeting. So, um, you know, whatever, there's a huge, huge time commitment. So I would ask that at this time at least to appoint that in case something does happen as part of the special election, I'm sorry, the special session that we have a representative. So I, I agree with you, but I would ask that you take that into consideration. Any other comments? Not seeing any, all in favor? Thank you. Um, next item, standing and special committee reports. Councilor Hayes? Nothing. Uh, no, Sean, you said one. Then this one? Yours. Oh, my other one, sorry. I was just so happy to get going. Yeah, um, right? uh, uh, yeah I know. Order number 17-103 is an act on the request to extend the reporting time of the Town Council's Ad Hoc Election Committee oh, yes. to the October 18, 2017 Town Council meeting. Um, we have had um, a little bit of challenge in uh, finding time for all of us to meet solely because of our uh, schedules um, this past week. This week alone, every night has been something related to the town council, um, in which both staff and the council, you know, the council members on this, um, as well as others. So I just simply ask that you extend it for us so that we can continue meeting until October 18th. Is there any public comment? Not seeing any, is there action? So moved. moved. Second. Any comments? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Now, standing in special committee reports and liaison reports, Councilor Hayes. Okay, nothing to report today, <laughs> just like last time. So. Councilor St. Clair. Um, I, uh, there will, next meeting, we will have, be able to present uh, the communications strategic plan. Um, there was a miscommunication on my part, and I um, uh, was not prepared tonight to present that. And we do meet tomorrow, communications committee meets tomorrow. We're going to review that again. Uh, with some input from some other people, and we'll get that back out, and we'll present it at the next town meeting. That's it for me. Council Donovan. Uh, pest management met today. Uh, focus uh, was on working uh, with the uh, new uh, and and getting in tune with the new contractor and Todd Souza on turf management. Uh, very constructive discussion uh, uh, on uh, uh, seeking out best practices. Um, uh, also, uh, 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 input on the comprehensive plan. I think the uh, uh, Energy Committee really has led the way in terms of committee work uh, on uh, uh, the comprehensive plan uh, drafting. They've done a very good job. The uh, Pest Management People uh, Committee now understands they have an opportunity to uh, have a, a, a say in this and uh, as at the all board all committee meeting, uh, it was told, uh, all the committees were told, this is now the opportunity, and by November, December, try and get your work back in uh, so it'll be useful. Uh, planning board, uh, I asked Jay Chase to give me a summary on the Gateway Commons project because it, I knew that we had the uh, Housing Alliance uh, here today. Jay got back to me with a nice executive summary. Uh, uh, and I'll just read it quickly. Having secured planning board approval in August, the developer is working through the building permit permitting process at this time. We've conducted a pre-construction meeting within the past few weeks, so they are definitely gearing up to go. The first phase of development will include all the site work and infrastructure, and then they will start on the buildings. It will be a very busy site once they get rolling on the foundations. They are hoping for an 18-month time frame to full build-out, which I thought was a good report uh, for all of us to understand in light of uh, the affordable housing issues that were before us today. Thank you. Council Rowan? Ah, thank you. Um, so the um, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee um, met last night. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to attend. I had a, another commitment, um, so I will have to report <coughs> at the next meeting. Um, the um, Housing Alliance met on Monday. Uh, obviously, we were finalizing um, our recommendations, which we had a discussion about earlier. Um, there was also um, a discussion about the, the two um, current projects and kind of how to address them, um, that being Avesta, um, Southgate, um, they discovered during their environmental assessment that there was um, additional lead abatement, um, which um, uh, was more than they were expecting. Um, they were able to resolve the, the tax credit gap um, with um, some additional grant funds that they were able to secure, um, but now that it, uh, once again, is, is 
they're raising the issue that that um, they're still struggling. Um, they're hopeful <coughs> that the contracting bids uh, will come back um, favorably and allow them to proceed. Um, then um, we also discussed um, a proposal from uh, Bessie Commons around um, they're also putting in a, a bid to the main housing uh, authority um, or intending to over the next um, in November and then in, in February um, and potentially securing some funds from the town would help improve their score. Um, then SEDCO um, has met twice or they had uh, a board meeting in um, on September 21st. Uh, we met at the um, the public safety building um, and uh, there was a tour of the building um, and a presentation from um, the chief of police and uh, um, the fire chief um, and a, a healthy discussion around um, um, around trying hope, hopefully garnering support. Um, they were pretty unanimous in in agreeing that um, this is something that the town needs and it's a good use of of the funds um, and uh, they're they're hoping to um, express publicly that sentiment. Um, Uh, and then further discussion at that meeting was about the annual meeting, which uh, was last night um, at Black Point Inn. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended. It was a terrific event, and uh, specific thanks to uh, the SEDCO board for putting it on, and, and in particular, um, Karen and Magda for um, mm. putting together a great, great event. Um, there were some, uh, another thank you to the keynote speaker last night, uh, Peter Twachman. Um, who gave a great? Uh, he's the CEO of COO, excuse me, of the uh, Migus Hotel Group, which runs uh, both the Black Point Inn and the uh, now the Higgins Beach Inn as well. Um, he gave a terrific, terrific talk. Um, I also wanted to express congratulations to the award winners last night. Um, there was the Project of the Year uh, for 2017 for New Build, which was awarded to Martin's Point Healthcare. Um, there was the Project of the Year 2017 for renovation, which went to the Holy Donut. Um, legacy business of 2017, um, which went to Highland Avenue Greenhouse and Farm Market. Um, and the small business of 2017, which was went to uh, Muddy Paws Academy. So congratulations to all. Thank you. Councilor Foley? You just wore me out. Um, <laughs> All, all my committees tend to meet the first week of the uh, month, so I'll be very active between now and our next meeting, but I have none. Thank you. Uh, the only, under the chair, there's only two um, pieces that I wanted to mention. First is, and it's more public announcement, uh, absentee ballots are available at Town Hall during normal business hours, so if you can't make it on um, Election Day, please come in early. Also, uh, just as a public notification, the Chamber of Commerce is hosting their candidates night on uh, October 12th. I forgot what time it starts. Uh, Six o'clock, I believe. So the school board's earlier. I mean, the yeah. town council is at 7.30. I know that, but so maybe at 7 o'clock is the school board. Yeah, there's sanitary trustees, yeah. school yeah. board, and then town council. Usually there's an advertisement, but people should know that uh, that is happening. And that's all I have. Um, town manager's report. Yes. I'm afraid I'm fading fast. So I have two quick things at your places this evening. You'll see the tax commitment report. This is something uh, Actually, Bill Healy started, Matt Sturgis continued, and we're going to continue that tradition. So it's chock full of information related to all the effort culminates in the tax commitment every year. And the reason I'm fading, I uh, did attend the NMA annual convention today, and I was uh, lucky enough to be a presenter on a panel. Um, one of my colleagues, Rick Fates from the town of Rockport, and I presented on a topic called Budget and Taxes in Growth Communities. And I chose to use the opportunity, having grown up in northern Maine and worked 10 years in mid-coast Maine, I've got an appreciation for how uh, the coast and maybe the Gold Coast is recognized by others in the state. And I just wanted them to appreciate that uh, we have some challenges too, that it's just not all rosy, that um, often we're a victim of our success and that it can present some different challenges, much different than they have, but at the end of the day, it's all about pressure on the property tax. So. It was well received, and I was certainly pleased to represent the town there. Excellent. If there's nothing else, uh, personal or co council comments, Council Donovan. Yeah, uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, Dan Bacon and Brian Longstaff and I are presenting uh, to the uh, MMA 
uh, convention uh, on form-based zoning. Uh, and uh, and uh, I thought that was uh, a great opportunity, especially uh, after having attended all of the Plana Palooza uh, comprehensive plan sessions because uh, a big part of what uh, the team of people who uh, were the consultants noted was that form-based zoning uh, uh, really allows you to do downtown kind of things. And so when we talked about Route 1, uh, when people talked about Scarborough Downs, uh, it was a lot about form-based zoning. So this town council may see it back before us again. I thought that was an interesting. Uh, uh, the meetings themselves were terrific. Uh, what it told me that we have several hundred leaders in this town. And you see the same people attending all of these different sessions and wanting to contribute. Uh, uh, the SEDCO annual meeting last night, it just did my heart good. It just, it's the best of Scarborough shining through. It really is. Uh, it, uh, people volunteering and working together, the leadership of the community uh, is there. It really gives me hope against the divisiveness that sometimes pops itself up, whether we're talking locally or nationally. And that can be very discouraging to people. So. Uh, that's it. Council Rowan? I have nothing, thank you. Council Foley? Yeah, I would just echo, uh, I couldn't stay for the whole event last night, but thank you to Sedco and the board for putting that on. I always just love the view there. Um, it does something for my heart, uh, just peaceful. Um, I know there's been some concerns, I, I guess I would say around Planapalooza and the fact that maybe it is just <coughs> the same people showing all up all the time. Uh, so I would just really encourage people to, uh, it's not, it's a dynamic process and it's not over. It wasn't a one-time event, it's an ongoing process. So, um, you know, check out the Scarborough Engage, is it www.scarboroughengage.com? Correct. Okay, so Engage Scarborough, not Scarborough Engage. So, sorry, thank you. Um, check that out talk to people, figure out how else you can still provide some input because there are lots of, there's lots of work still to come. It's not over by any stretch of the imagination. So that's all. Thank you. Excellent. I have one item. Uh, October, I forgot to mention, October 19th at 7 p.m., the town council will be joining the school board at their meeting for a workshop regarding the uh, recommendation for an uh, ad hoc budget advisory committee. Um, and I have no other personal comments, but Councilor St. Clair. Um, yeah, I have one. It's a, it's a, it is. It's a personal comment. <laughs> um, we don't meet again, but on Saturday the 14th um, is our fifth annual Team Kyle 5K. It's held in Scarborough. Um, it's the fifth anniversary, so that's kind of exciting for us. Right now we presently have about 250 runners registered, um, and we usually get an influx towards the end, so I'm hoping that we'll be around 300, but it's kind of exciting. Um, it's obviously in memory of my son who passed away um, a few years ago. So, thanks. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I guess on a little different note, maybe kind of build in on some of the comments by, by Councilor Donovan. Um, you know, as we see here, thoughts and prayers for the events in Las Vegas this week um, <clears throat> really shows you how small the world really is mm -hmm. and how we're all so interconnected. My wife's friend's son was at the concert, and someone that he was with was one of the individuals shot. Uh, but the stories that are coming out of Las Vegas and what people did for each other and how they came to help, people were putting their bodies on top of others to protect them. So, so sort of accounts of Donovan's, there is some good out there as much as there's things that are happening. I just hope we as a community can build on some of that good and, and bring that back. But it's just a sobering moment, so just uh, thoughts and prayers go out to all those folks that are impacted. Thank you. Nice way to end. If there is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Thank you. Second. Second.